Hello. Good evening. Hello. How you doing, Martin? I'm doing okay. How about yourself? Hi, everybody. Hi, Amber. A good good day in America today. <laughs> it's true. Our standards have gotten so low that merely watching ordinary processes <laughs> unfold in an ordinary way is a great day. Yes, yes. You know, who knew C-SPAN would become, you know, such hot entertainment? Yeah, a, a totally uneventful day ranks not, ranks not very high in my opinion. <laughs> I remember uh, 90, uh, January of 93, I was in college in D.C., so I stood out 8 o'clock in the morning. And we didn't leave until after Ray Charles sang America the Beautiful, which wow. was one of his final public performances. Wow. And I got to tell you, that was amazing. Yeah, that Ray be... Charles' America the Beautiful is not something you forget. It's something you tell your grandkids wow. about. That's awesome. Yeah my, yeah, my wife and I were down in uh, for Obama's um, inauguration. It was amazing, just the amount of people and the joy in the room, the joy in the air and just a celebration. It was, it was an amazing experience. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I remember um, I remember coming to work the day after the inauguration and uh, my office neighbor, uh, who's my partner now, was uh, the black guy was playing uh, Change Gonna Come. Right, yep. Yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a very moving experience. We were all in tears, but yeah, it was a great, great day. <clears throat> Tears of joy. <laughs> and from poetry to prose, as we move yeah, the through. Yeah, the was pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Speaking of. Yes. We are All loading right. onto YouTube. And we're all set. Okay, and if there are members of the public out there, this is uh, viewable on LMC TV or on YouTube, and then the uh, instructions are on the uh, posted agenda or on Zoom uh, if you prefer. And if there are any members of the public out there paying attention to what we do, we do appreciate it. This is public business. I'm gonna make a motion to open the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries, we're open. Uh, and the first agenda item for the evening is uh, once again 1165 Grecian Point Road. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Can you uh, hear me? This is Kristen Motel from Cuddy and Fader. Yes, I can. Good okay. evening, Ms. Motel. Great, great. Welcome back. Thank you. I don't have video right now, um, but if if you can hear me all right, let's just proceed. Audio um, is just fine. I can hear your voice. Go great, ahead. Great. Uh, good evening, everyone. And um, it's nice to see you, Commissioner Exisa. I'm Kristen Motel from the law firm Cuddy and Fader here on behalf of the applicants for 1165 Grecian Point. Uh, with me tonight is actually my colleague, Tony Geoffrey. Um, the property owners, Bill and Elizabeth Fadina, our floodplain specialist, Leonard Jackson, Rich Cordone from JMC, the site engineer, and Beth Evans, our wetlands and environmental consultant. Um, and, and Mr. Chairman, I know it's it's been a few months since we were on. We we took we were last before you in November, and we took a month to to carefully consider those comments and, and prepare the materials requested. I don't know since we have a new 
commissioner as well as new planning staff and, and a new council if you want me to provide a more detailed overview of the project or if you just like a brief recap of where we're at. Uh, I, I know that our, um, our new council is uh, up to speed on at least on, on the, the, the core issues that we've been talking a lot about. Uh, whether we have a, um, you know, I've I've reviewed and I've made sure that uh, that our council is familiar with your December 30 submission. Um, I I guess I'll if if we need a longer background, I'm going to leave it up to Miss Achisa because this is uh, the first time that uh, she's been on board for a discussion of this. And if she feels she needs the background, I, I won't get between between her and that background. That sounds good to me. Thank you. Okay, well, let's let's sort of do the overview then. Okay, great. Uh, so the this is actually the applicant's fifth appearance. Um, we submitted for the project in April, and since then we've taken usually a month in between meetings to, um, like I said, consider comments and thoroughly prepare the materials. Um, the property is located along Delancey Cove. Uh, within a floodplain, it's flood zone AE with a base flood elevation of 13. Uh, the property has wetlands as well as a wetland buffer area. Um, the existing wetland and buffer area is actually maintained as lawn. Uh, there's no stormwater management infrastructure on the property and it's not currently served um, by a sewer. Now the applicant is here on referral from the planning board they're seeking a wetlands permit for the proposed demolition of the existing home. That home is uninhabitable and in a state of disrepair. Uh, they're seeking to replace it with a new single family home. Uh, it, it will be fully compliant with all FEMA and village floodplain development standards. The new home is also uh, smaller in size than most of the surrounding homes on Grecian Point Road. Um, as part of the project, the applicant seeks to replace the existing septic system, which is failing, and it's partially located within a wetland buffer. Uh, we're seeking to replace it with a new septic system that meets the Department of Health code for Westchester County. Uh, in the last few months, there have been concessions made by the applicant and amendments to the project. Uh, so pretty considerable amendments that include um, decreasing the size of the garage, um, reconfiguring the garage so that it is uh, no longer attached to the home. So eliminating the breezeway that was originally proposed as part of the home, uh, making the driveway smaller and moving the garage a lot closer to the road. All of that reduced the impervious surface that's proposed. So right now there's no increase in impervious surface that's proposed within the wetland buffer on the property. Um, the applicant's also proposing wetland and buffer plantings to restore wetland habitat, to reduce erosion and flooding impacts, and to stabilize the shoreline. That was something um, that came about a few months ago as an outgrowth of commissioner comments. And as I mentioned, we're proposing stormwater management infrastructure where none exists now. Um, and the home in the garage will actually, the new home in the garage will be placed further from the wetland than the existing home is today. Uh, so that kind of brings us to where we are now. Um, as the commissioners are aware, most of the discussion on this application uh, has really focused on the proposed import of fill to the site that is required to replace the existing septic system. Uh, through the last five meetings and many months, we've decreased the proposed amount of fill it was originally over a thousand cubic yards, and now it's down to 420 cubic yards. Uh, as I previously mentioned, there's no public sewer on Grecian Point Road. Um, there are 11 private sewer lines that were previously installed. Uh, the fill is being proposed as part of the, the septic system. It's needed for the required separation and for the septic system to meet code. Uh, it's not required for anything else. So it's exclusively for the septic system. And the applicant in November was asked to explore the feasibility of installing a public and 
or a private sanitary sewer line and to provide the commissioners with some evidence as to why we believe um, that it's it's not feasible to try to install a public or a private sewer line. Um, that December 30th submission includes those details and it also includes an opinion from Leonard Jackson that notes the addition of fill, um, the 420 cubic yards we're proposing will not negatively impact uh, the site. It won't negatively impact the surrounding properties and it's not going to damage natural resources because of erosion or flooding, uh, and therefore it is consistent with the LWRP. As you are aware, um, there is no policy in the LWRP ex exclusively prohibiting fill within a flood zone. Um, however, we do understand the commissioner's concerns about fill and how that could possibly negatively impact the site and resources, neighboring lots when it comes to flooding and erosion. Um, and as an outgrowth of the last meeting, the, the commissioners did bring Mr. Jackson on board. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, he has over 47 years of experience in flood control design, and that includes flood control design for FEMA. Um, I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to stop you there just a second, Ms. Motel, because I, I, I think you just unintentionally misspoke. You said the commissioners brought on board Mr. Jackson. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. yes. Okay. Sorry. He's, got, he's, not, he's not working for us. Good catch. No, that, that is very true. Um, let's see, where was I? Oh, so I, I know Sven Hogard, the village's environmental consultant, is not here tonight, uh, but he has previously opined on the project. Um, as well as Beth Evans, the applicant's environmental consultant. Um, both have determined that the project will not have negative impact to the wetlands, uh, the natural resources, wetland species, or the buffer area. Um, and the applicant has been granted a tidal wetlands permit from the DEC. And that was also included uh, in our last submission. So I'll give a... a brief overview of the public and private sewer options as we outlaid them in the December submission. Uh, we do have a team of experts here tonight. So when I'm done, I'll, I'll turn this over to, to Leonard Jackson to give you a, a brief summary of his opinion. And then uh, if there are questions from the commissioners about the, the sewer and any technical um, aspects of that, we have our team of consultants here who can, who can answer those questions too. So turning to the, the public sewer connection feasibility, as I mentioned, there's no public sewer line on Grecian Point Road. And the applicant's actually very familiar with um, the process for uh, uh, installing a public sewer line. Um, about a year and a half before we applied to the, the HCZMC, which was in April, they spent uh, those almost two years working with the neighborhood trying to um, gauge interest for a public sewer. They were trying to pursue this. Uh, so, you know, they helped educate uh, the whole team on, uh, on their findings and, and what they've undertaken. Um, we did provide to the commission a brief overview of why the public sewer is not feasible. That includes first, um, it requires the abandonment of the existing private lines. Uh, like I said, 11 private lines under Grecian Point Road and per the village and Westchester County Sanitary Code, um, any property owner that abuts a street with a public sewer must directly connect to that public sewer. So would it require abandonment of those 11 lines? Uh, second, this portion of Grecian Road is privately owned. It's owned by the Grecian Point Road Corporation. Uh, it's not a public road. So therefore, you know, any work to install sewer lines requires approvals and easements from this third party corporation. Um, and, and the applicant is here tonight. He, he can detail a little bit more of his conversations and his efforts with the corporation to talk to them about um, their interest in installing a public sewer line. Uh, we included some of those details in our submission. Uh, also for a public line, as you know, the village would need to accept dedication and assume operation and maintenance costs per county code. Uh, the applicant has tried numerous times to reach out to the village manager's office to gauge interest in this and have a discussion. Um, to date, there hasn't been a response. 
So, you know, we would respectfully submit between the um, required abandonment of 11 lines, the third party owner and uh, the village needing to accept dedication, it would be impractical in this instance to install a public sewer. Turning to the private sewer connection feasibility, um, the same holds true with the third party owner. Um, the applicant also had previously explored whether or not they could um, install a private line uh, back in 2019. We submitted correspondence in our December submission, um, which demonstrates that. And it also demonstrates um, that Hernani, the village engineer at the time, made the determination that there could not be another private line installed under Grecian Point Road. Um, and also... Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, and also just to summarize something that we had spoken about last time, um, the county code prohibits an owner from connecting to an existing private line. Each private line can only serve one residence. So we can't connect to one of those 11 lines. We would need to install a new line. And installing a new line presents a number of different engineering concerns. Um, most importantly, it creates infrastructure overcrowding and that could have potentially uh, negative impacts on the environment as well as safety. Um, with all of those lines in the street and there's 11 sewer lines, but like I said, there's also uh, stormwater infrastructure and public utility lines that exist. Um, so things are becoming very crowded. There's an increased chance every time, uh, you know, somebody either needs to do maintenance or monitoring um, for accidental damage to an adjacent line as well as uh, you know, resulting in a leak to Long Island Sound. Um, there's operation and maintenance issues associated with private lines as well. Uh, each owner is responsible for identifying leaks and maintaining that, that line in the infrastructure. Um, and since there is an increased risk of damage with so much infrastructure under the road, you know, it would make it very difficult to identify uh, you know, where the leak is coming from and the person responsible for remediating that damage. And, and all of that is detailed more in our submission in JMC's memorandum. Uh, Rich Cordon can speak a little bit more to that. Um, the addition of a line would also limit um, future space for any future utilities, drainage, or uh, private infrastructure. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, and on top of this, it's a, it's a massive undertaking to, you know, negotiate access and easements with a third party to close the street, to excavate, to lay the lines, uh, to monitor. It's, you know, we would submit that it's um, not practical in this case when there is um, an existing failing septic system that can be replaced. So um, at this time, you know, I can turn it over to Leonard Jackson. I think you know he's going to speak just very briefly on his opinion with regard to the 420 cubic yards of fill that we're proposing, and um, we can go from there, Mr. Chairman, if that if that sounds like a good plan. I guess the first thing I want to do, and and because we have one commissioner who is discussing this in public for the first time, um, we, and and I did this the last time this was up for us. It, we all know where we're focused. We, we, we are talking primarily about septic versus sewer feasibility and fill because the fill is only necessary if the septic is necessary. And that's the question that most of us are focused on. But if someone has a, a, a question or concern that they want to talk about that is not sewer, septic and fill, let's get that out of the way first and then have the rest of our conversation about how we get to the evidentiary quantum each of us needs to cast our consistency vote on the core issues that we're all that we've all been focused on i have a quick question if i can get it in thomas yeah yeah go ahead quick quick question on the storm water um has has our village engineer reviewed the storm water plan Um, from my last, uh, I think from the last time uh, this application was done, uh, Brian, I think, uh, clarified that all stormwater comments have been satisfied um, for, for the project. The, the December 30th submission also included 
uh, the, the recent memo from Brian as well as our response. Okay. So I, I don't believe there are outstanding issues that would prevent a consistency determination. There are things that need to be done, standard things that need to be done before, um, for example, a building permit can be pulled. Right, but didn't you change the plan? Isn't there a change in the stormwater of the cistern, those two infiltrators? The stormwater's all been approved. The stormwater's all been reviewed by Brian and uh, Kellard Sessions' office, and it's been that that has that has uh, largely not changed. That's all been reviewed and approved. In, so did, in the form that it existed it? for the November submission. The form that it exists today. Where is that? Um, I, thought Brian, I thought Brian had left before you made your new submission. Brian saw that previous submission. This has been this this stormwater design has been this stormwater design for a while now. I think, okay. Rich, what you're what you're saying is that the stormwater design hasn't changed since our November submission, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you were able to maintain the same SWIP when when you made the changes in November. That's correct. There were some minor edits, and there was a couple of things that we had to we added onto there in the maintenance area where we discussed some work on the on the rainwater harvest. Uh, Rain gardens. There was a, a maintenance question on that that was addressed. So, so since, since since we've been focused on the sewer for the last uh, few sessions, uh, has the new engineer looked at this? And has a new engineer um, can the new engineer tell me about the the, the groundwater and how this new uh, stormwater system uh, will integrate with the with the current soil conditions? Or if he hasn't, can you can you look at that now, or you know, we'll come back to it. I would I would have to um, look at look at the the new um, stormwater plan and then provide comments. Just apologies, we we had a our office had a little um, compromise in our system, so it prevented us from reviewing and getting a um, the review in time for this meeting. So, right. Okay, if you can look at that, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I remember Brian, what, what is your name? Uh, Esteban Garcia. Okay, great. Um, yeah, if you could, if you could look at that, if you have a few minutes, you just look at that, we'll maybe go back to it. Okay. I, I have, I have some related questions I might tack on to that. So the SWIP is dated uh, December 29th. I assume that there's minor updates is what I'm hearing. It's a little difficult for me, a hundred page document to have an update 1229 with no red line or anything. Um, it, it seems like, you know, at least going forward. That was Excuse me, um, Seamus, if you look, if you would look at the comment response that we prepared, we outlined exactly what we changed. The only thing that's changed in this SWIP is the addition of some, uh, the, the maintenance discussion on the rain, rain, uh, rain gardens, I believe. It is outlined in the comment and response memorandum that was prepared for Kellard Sessions' office. Okay, which, um, and it could just be that there's some documents here, but uh, I, I thought I'd gone through them all. So which which document outline, outlines the changes? There's a memorandum that we prepared as part of the submission where we resubmitted, where we went through Kellard Sessions review memorandum and every comment that we they prepared, we, we gave a, a, a concise response and explained what we did and how we responded to it. Um, I'm you know trying the date, to- the date of that memo? Everything would have been dated on the- uh, Is it called cover letter? No. Not the um, one for this meeting. It must be somewhere in the past. It, this one, this meeting did have one, but it was also the previous meeting that we had done. Every every um, resubmission that we've done, any type of comments that we've made to the uh, responses we've made to the village engineer, we have done a, a full comment response letter. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull up your agenda here and see if I can find it. Yeah, and, and what I was saying is I don't believe that that was on our cover letter for today's meeting. It must have been on a cover letter for a prior meeting. It was submitted. Um, and then um, I'll, I'll keep going because I, I just if you look, I'm sorry, it's exhibit Q in the agenda. 
Oh, no, that's not. I apologize. I saw the village engineer response letter. I see that's dated uh, 12, 2019. So let me, let me add the last piece on here on this topic for me. So like I said, it's just if, if it's, it's helpful if you have something like a red line or something like here's what changed. Um, and then I don't think that Kellard sessions themselves uh, since September 14th have produced anything, but I, I'd ha be happy to be pointed to it if they had, which is other than your guys' responses, what I usually see from them is a response to the response where they kind of like addressed, addressed, okay. Um, so I think that there's still the outstanding Kellard Sessions um, memo, the last one, you know, asking about the Westchester County Health Department approval of the septic, talking about details on the rain garden, which it sounds like you addressed, uh, avoiding submerged pipe networks, and a couple of minor items that were numbered number 23 through 26. So I, I don't think I've seen that loop um, closed yet. Those are those are minor items, and we can work on we can work on that if if we can work on that with Kellard Session. There's Kellard Sessions office. There's nothing in those comments that's that's really that's that we wouldn't be able to address and work with. Esteban, do you agree with that statement? Uh, yes, agreed. Great. And I just wanted to piggyback, Andrew, because I had the same thoughts there. So that's that's all. Um, that I had on that. Yeah, just, just to be clear uh, and just to be specific, so we know what my question revolves the proposed subsurface detention system. Um, that's uh, where is it? It's to, as you look at the plan to the right, that's going to be buried to an elevation of 7.5, uh, right? And that's near that backyard that we've all experienced was very, very wet. I just want to, um, is, there any, is there any testing? Is there any? idea of what the, the soil conditions are at that depth, and this is also relevant to the septic system, what are the, what are the soil conditions at th that depth? Will, will the water, um, after a rain, in, in a dry condition, whatever the conditions are, will, will the, the water that's detained there sufficiently be um, released and absorbed back into the ground? Commissioner Maggio, we, we looked at this. This is actually a closed system. What it does is it's basically designed, there's a liner in there, these, these storm techs and cold techs, what they're there to do is they're actually there to um, detain the water and slowly release it back into the environment after a, a rain event, as opposed to having it just flush through the ground without having to, you know, gently re return. So that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what we, uh, you know, how we have it designed. It's designed in accordance with the village code. It's also designed in accordance with the DEC standards. And we, if there's anything um, further with Kellard's office that they have any comments on or questions on, that's something that we'll be able to work through. With regarding the septic, deep test hole pit, deep test pits were dug. They were observed by the Westchester County Department of Health and the septic system is proposed to be sited at an elevation that provides you uh, a sufficient separation between rock and uh, the bottom of the absorption fields. There was no water that was encountered on the front of the site at that elevation. Right, that, you, that, that's exactly what I'm driving at. So the test pit data it, is on this, is submitted here with the rest of these documents? That test pit data, I don't believe was submitted there because uh, that was submitted to the health department. Uh, anything from the health department that, that has the test pit data? No, that's not, that hasn't been, that hasn't been circulated to your office. That's, that's under the health department's purview, the elevation of uh, any type of rock or groundwater. We can circulate them to you, surely, but there was no water that was encountered in the front of the house where the proposed septic system is going to be. And what about the back of the house where the detention? Uh, the There's no water. test pits there. That stormwater system is designed to be a detention system. It's a it's a watertight system that simply detains the water. It doesn't infiltrate. No test pits are required. Well, you know, I mean, ultimately, it has to infiltrate. It's not. I mean, it could be filled up, right? So it's not designed to hold. It's not a closed system. It's an it's an open system that that releases the water slowly, though, right? No, it, it's a closed system. It's a closed system that d diffuses the water slowly at the at a, at a slower rate um, under proposed conditions that it does under existing. 
So what right. it does yeah, is but, it's but maintaining. But ultimately, hold on, hold on. Right, it it slowly diffuses the, the water, but slowly diffuses it into the ground, not into some other tank. I it mean, sheet flows. Water... It sheet flows the same way that it does in today's conditions. Right. Ultimately, the water ends up in the ground, though, right? Correct. Okay. All right. So, if you have any, if, if you have any test pit data or health department data, anything about um, the absorption rates in the back of the property for the stormwater and in the front of this property for the septic system, I'd love to see that. If you have it, do you not have it? If you don't have it, you don't have it. I, I don't have it here tonight. I don't have it here tonight. Okay, not, not, not tonight. That's okay. That's okay. If you we have it. we have test results. We have test results for the front of the property. We have nothing in the back. This there's no there's no outline from the DEC or the village code or anything that requires uh, testing for percolation rates for a closed absorption system. The system has been, the, the, the existing systems proposed exactly where the uh, current garage is. So we were able to eliminate the necessity to bring fill in for that. Um, it, it, it's designed, everything is designed in accordance with all the regulations that are out there, be it DEC, be it village, be it New York State Building Code. The system is 100% compliant. Right. I'm sure it's compliant, but I just want to, don't you want to know if you're releasing water into the ground that the ground can absorb that water? Isn't that something? The ground's that taking the water. Water. There's no more, there's no difference. There's no difference to, in the amount of water that falls today than is going to fall tomorrow. There's no impact on the, on this, with this stormwater system. The only difference is the water after it goes through a stormwater system is going to be cleaner to after post-development than pre-development because the water is going to be going through, it's going to be going through a rainwater harvesting tank where it's being allowed to settle. It's going to be going through a detention tank, a detention system where it's settling out and it's slowly, slowly being dispersed into the environment as opposed to the sheet flow that's happening on the site today. Right. And again, the, the reason I ask so you understand my my thought is just because that backyard is super, super wet. And every time I've been there, I, I've noticed that it's very, very wet. And that, uh, you know, this is gonna be buried pretty far into the ground just to see if the, if, if the ground is that wet all the time or some of the time or when you did this test bit. But any information you have, if you can forward it on, I, I'd, like, I'd like to take a look. Understood. If you have it, if you don't, you don't. We don't have any information for the back of the, back of the building. Okay. Okay. That's an answer. Thank you. Okay. Any, anyone else on uh, items that are not uh, the fill, sewer, the septic? Martin. So um, uh, first off, I would like to say uh, thank you for uh, addressing exhibit B uh, directly to me <laughs> about the grasses. Um, However, uh, I do think that there is, I, I appreciate that, that this, this document establishes that grasses are a good um, uh, proposal. However, the response is a little confused because it's comparing whether trees are, gra are better, or whether grasses are better than trees. And that was really not where my comment was coming from. Our comments were coming from the removal of the trees and their root system, their already uh, existing root systems, uh, not planting new trees and waiting for them to grow in order to be able to stabilize the ground. So, Understood, Commissioner Hain. And at the same time, what we're trying to do is express to you and explain to you the difference in, um, you know, when you have an existing tree canopy, there's no trees, on, there's no grass underneath that tree. Um, very, very sparse grass. It's more prone actually to erosion as opposed to as if it was vegetated. That's if you look at a lot of large trees, you, you'll see that there's a there's a substantial sparse patch of grass that is susceptible to erosion. You know, I understand a, the roots of those trees, they go deeper. So that's why they're, they're going to they're going to uh, hold back the soils that's you know a foot deep two feet deep three feet deep but it's not going to do anything for the soils that are all the way up on the top the soils on the top unless you have some type of mulch or something else like that that's planted there or some type of mulch or something to hold back the erosion you're not going to be able to get a vegetation that grows on the underneath on the understory i understand that i was just trying to clarify that that our, our that the comparison that was being made was not 
directly addressing the issue that was that was brought forth. All right. Are we are we through our uh, our sort of non core items? All right. Then I think we uh, we return to the to the continuing discussion about uh, the feasibility of of sewer options as distinct from septic. I want to I, I want to ask what may be a silly question because we we may have we may have sort of skipped a step in what I think was the preliminary review discussion. Um, we heard that the the existing septic was uh, existing septic system was non functional and and needed to be replaced with a new one. We've been talking ever since about whether it needed to be replaced with a new one that requires fill or it needs to be replaced with some kind of sewer connection instead. What is the state of the existing system, uh, and why couldn't that be rehabilitated in place, given that it obviously has clearance that doesn't uh, doesn't require further fill. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it does require further fill. In order to construct a, a, a system that's in accordance with the health department regulations, they're going to be, the applicant would be required to bring fill in. Would it be, would it be unlawful for them to, to simply fix the existing system in kind in place? The existing system is not, it's clogged. It's, it's been, there's nothing to fix. You well, when you say there's nothing to fix, I mean, it, there, you would have there, to replace the septic tank and the septic fields in order if you're to replace the septic tank and the septic fields, that is no longer a repair that's considered a remediation and a health and a remediation with the health department means it has to be brought up to current standards for us to do anything but the right fix here is much worse than for us for us to install a septic system in the existing grade it's not it's gonna it's gonna fail it's setting ourselves up for failure we're, we're not going to have a system that's gonna it's worse for the environment to do a band-aid like that than it would be to do the system the right way okay thank you that that's a straight answer and and i uh, i think you know i needed to feel like i had touch the base on on mm -hmm. that part of the record. So I've I've asked and you've answered why the existing one is a no go. So we are at septic with fill or some kind of sewer connection. Now I I will tell you I've been through the the December 30 uh, memo that uh, for for you know administrative reasons we didn't uh, we haven't had quite that long with it. It was wasn't up to, uploaded quite uh, right away. So I've had a little less time with it than than, than perhaps I would have liked, but I've been over it a few times. And my reaction to it is there are, there are things here that I, that are brand new to me, at least in terms of um, as a focus of the discussion. We, we've talked a little bit about that there are a number of other lines under the road, but this is the first time I've seen really fleshed out the idea that a, that the primary concern or one of the primary concerns with a private line is that there are already 11 there and the difficulty of uh, putting in another one comes from the danger of damaging another existing line. Um, I kind of look at I kind of look at everything through the eyes that I bring to my day job and I'm, I'm a litigator and uh, there's a word that I hate that judges throw at me sometimes when I lose that word is speculative. Um, it seems some things are easily quantified and some things are just, this is what I think. It seems both odd and difficult to quantify to say that the reason something can't be done is in fact that it can be done, but there's a risk of something going wrong because there's always a risk of something going wrong. There are lines in the road, but there are 11 houses that are on private sewer lines. We don't know in advance. And as far as I can tell from the submission, can't quantify whether something else is going to be damaged in laying that line. Is there, is there something you could, me, could give me that would quantify for me how likely it is that another line would be damaged in trying to lay an additional private line connection 
there's Mr. chairman i think before we we address that question um and which is a very good question there's there's also more than just our concern about um damaging an existing line by installing this line it's then the operation and maintenance required going forward of everything in the road, right? So it's not just the fact that, oh, we're, we're concerned about installing it. We're concerned about installing and maintenance. And, and like I said, that's just one of like the four principal reasons, but I, I, and I understand what you're saying. I just wanna make that clear. Ms. Motel, that is entirely fair. Um, I'm trying to, uh, that's right. Uh, I hadn't, I hadn't thought with much intensity about, you know, the where in the where in the hierarchy of reasons this uh, is a problem. Uh, I should put, well, there's a lot of stuff under that road and it, it's really taken. You're right that it's not the only thing that the, the submission says it's it's taken a prominent role. And so now that I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking that it is it's both. Um, unquantified forecasting, and I'm concerned that it's speculative. I, is, Mr. Gottlieb, is there, I'm, I'm, I'm picking on you, but if anybody else knows, you know, it, it thinks they can answer this for me, answer this for me. Can we get a consultant to give us more a, an, an independent set of insight into the engineering problem of laying a new private line where there are a large number of existing private lines. I, I understand that it's a line of spaghetti under there. There's a lot of stuff there. I need to understand um, as independently as I can, how much of a feasibility concern that is and how much it's a pain, but not a showstopper. Sure. So um, this board, just like any other land use board, has the ability to hire consultants that are needed throughout the review process as they deem necessary. Um, I do think that the village has um, escrow abilities. Um, and, you know, without any other approval, this board is um, uh, is completely reasonable to hire a consultant if you feel as though information has been submitted um, in the record that you as uh, volunteers, because I don't think anyone's getting paid to, to be on the commission, um, might not have. And so uh, typically an applicant will come with a consulting team. Um, and a lot of times it is only fair that the land use board has a professional that can concur, dissent, or come up with maybe a, a new creative idea that hasn't yet been considered. You know, I mean, typically we most often we either look to the experience of an environmental consultant where we most often work with with Sven Hoger and we know him well and we know what we want to ask him or we work with our consulting engineers. We are really drilling down on on some specialized stuff and we're down to uh, and I'm going to say this just to preview it for everybody. I'm sort of thinking the same way about hydrography because Everyone, everyone on this call has heard me probably at least twice say something about how much uh, we dislike net fill in floodplains. Um, we, we drive it out of applications whenever we can, when we have permitted, when, in my time on the commission, when we have permitted any net fill in a project where the project is in a floodplain, the fill itself has been outside the floodplain part of the project. Uh, and I, I think there may be precedents where that wasn't the case uh, before my time. Uh, I've never allowed it. I know that I'm the hawk on these, these issues. If we're going to think about that in terms of wiggle room, and, and when I say that, I'm talking about the last page of, uh, of the, uh, of the, the, uh, it, it, the JMC report that we got, uh, dated the 29th. Um, if, if, if we're to think more flexibly about net fill, um, I'm going to need a specialist to tell me that I, whether I should or shouldn't be doing it. I have this, you know, w there are more people killed by floods in America than any other kind of natural disaster. People live in floodplains and we don't, 
borrow all development and floodplains. We're talking about we've authorized them before and we'll authorize them again. Being very cautious about net fill in floodplains is a is a way that we prevent development here that puts things and people in harm's way. And we as a commission have been extremely cautious about that, both in a riverine and a coastal environment. The, I understand the hydrography is a little different. I feel like I need a better record before I could say that I, that I can vote consistent on net fill in a floodplain. I also, I also think I need our own hydrologist. Mr. Chairman, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I would also ask that our floodplain specialist, Lenny Jackson, be um, elevated to panelists so that he can also give you a, a, his opinion in a summary, because like I said, he, he is one of the leading experts in that field. Um, and then as to the, the sewer questions, you know, our team of experts and engineers has been working with Kellard Sessions office about that. So I know, you know, Keller Sessions is already retained as the village engineer. They've already been familiar with this project. I'm sure that they can uh, opine and comment on questions regarding sewer feasibility um, to the extent that, you know, we, we can move this forward. I, yes, I, I can say for myself that absolutely both that, you know, both of those things are going to be useful. I, you know, I have made it pretty clear that I think I need to have a very good understanding of, of what I'm voting on here before I cast my vote for uh, on consistency on this project. Um, if, I, I think that's probably what's next up, unless somebody really wants to interject something now that would that would move us forward before we hear from the the uh, the consulting team. For the I would applicant. just ask one question: Is this the first time that the board is? Um, hearing from Mr. Jackson or has seen his, his letter report? Yes. Okay, so, you know, if, if the board does want to go down the road of a consultant, oftentimes what I both tell clients and boards and so forth is when you look for a consultant to find someone that has the same general background, um, that way you are assured that you're getting a comprehensive review kind of from the beginning um and there's you know it reduces the, the amount of catch-up that has to happen that's probably right and you know the the faster but if we're going to need we're going to need consultants on this and we're going to need to do it fast because um when we when we have to hear from an applicant several times it starts to it starts to really make my teeth ache um uh, whatever we end up doing and not that not that the time has been wasted we have um, we're looking at a, a, a much different application now and the process has been extremely useful and productive but i hate it when it goes long we are a lot of meetings into this uh so we need to hop on that right away um amber i will call you first thing tomorrow morning i i think we we don't need a we don't need a board action to select a uh, to select our, our consultant as long as everybody agrees we need one, right? Yeah, if you wanted to just take a consensus on whether or not to um, retain a consultant, um, you could even you know express the scope of what you would like that consultant to review. Um, my office is happy to reach out and then give the board a list of consultants that you may want to consider. Okay, I think it's, I don't want to try to outline the scope. I know what I, I know what I think my questions are, but I don't want to try to outline the scope until after we've heard from Mr. Jackson, uh, because I think that's going to be a, a useful and illuminating discussion. So I think probably he has the floor. Thank you, Amber. Were you able to elevate Leonard Jackson to panelists? So, so I don't see anyone with that name on the attendees list. So if you could just raise his hand so that I know who, unless he's dialing in from a number. While we're waiting for this, can I just follow up on a quick uh, utility question? Or do you wanna do that later? 
Thomas. Uh, yeah. Anything that moves, anything that moves the ball forward, you have the floor, uh, Andrew. So, so quick, quick, quick question here. As I look, we're, we're, we're concerned about opening the, if we put another sewer line, opening the road and, and disturbing the other lines. And Esteban and, and Mr. Cardone, if you could just uh, follow you here. It, it, according to the plan, it looks like there's 10 pipes that run in one trench on the left side of the road as you go down towards the water. So, and those pipes are an inch and a quarter to two inch, two inches uh, in diameter. So if you have 10 pipes, let's use two inches, it's 20 inches, rounded up to two feet. Um, that's just one two foot trench. There's also a gas line and a water line on the left hand side. It looks like there's the 11th private sewer line, which is only an inch to two inches in diameter is on the other side of the street. It's, it's the street's pretty wide there, right? Is the concern that you would hit just that left side or uh, my point being, if you had to run another line, it, it seems like you have plenty of room in the street to run this thing or you just run it in the same trench where all the other, where, where the 10 other private sewer lines are. I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out what, what the actual problem is with, with the street. It's not like those uh, pipes are, are, you know, spaced one foot across, uh, you know, every, every foot there's the pipe running. It seems like the 90% of them are, are in one trench. Is that right or wrong? Uh, and Andrew, which uh, plan are you looking at? I'm just trying to get the a J, a, a J, J, a attachment. Kirby, J A Kirby plan exit N as built of sewer lines. J A Kirby land survey dated 11 23 2004. Okay. Am I reading that incorrectly? Where most of the utilities run down far left hand side of the street? I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the plan right now. Uh, I'm on page, uh, I'm on the second up? page. You're on uh, SB, SB2? SB2, yes. I'm looking specifically at the bottom footnote kind of in the middle. It says 10 pipes, two inch, one two inch HDPE, one two inch HDPE reserved for future use. We discussed that there's one there that would be great to, to get uh, the applicant to, you know, get permission from the use, but that's not practical. Then there's one, there's a, the rest of them are one and a quarter inch pipes. Did you see that, that note on the bottom of the page? Um, I'm seeing the next one where it says eight pipes, a two inch HDPE uh, for future use. And Yeah, uh, right. That's further down the road because I think two of them branched off into houses. Mm -hmm. But if you go, if you look to the right of that, it says 10 pipes, but w whichever way you look at it, 10 pipes, eight pipes, it's all one heavy line on the, on the, on kind of the extreme left-hand side of the road as you go down. True. Yes. So, so that's where all those pipes are, really, one, in one trench. Those pipes are in about a four to five foot wide swath. And they're not in a tight trench. That's from speaking with, uh, we spoke with the previous village engineer, Benny Salinicho, who watched it go in. It's not a nice, clean, it's not a perfectly uh, stacked, clean installation like you would expect from, say, an electrical duct bank. These are these are force mains that were placed in in a wide trench and there was rock that was encountered. So there was a little bit of work that was done to, uh, you know, try to make these things work. Did they, did they go did they go in in a group or did they go in one at a time? There was a, a there period? were two separate times that went on. Hold, just a second. I'm sorry. Yes. Hello. Eight zero eight two four one. Yes. Okay, um, hold on, guys. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get my floodplain consultant on the line. He's saying, Amber. He's telling me that the eight zero eight two four one is not working for the passcode. Oh, 
Okay, it should just be what is at the top of the agenda, as that has not changed. Yeah, yes, Amber, he's trying to he's trying to dial in. The the dial in number is six four six five five eight eight six five six. Yes, and then does he have to do the passcode? Um, I, is it asking for a passcode? Yes, and he's putting the passcode in, and it's not working. Okay. It's asking for a passcode, right, Lenny? No, he's got to put a meeting ID in there. There's a meeting ID okay. number. Okay, so you have to put the meeting ID number, and the meeting ID number is 951-0481. And then the next prompt, the next prompt, ask him for a passcode. Don't put in a passcode. Just press pound. Okay, and then the next prompt, you're just going to hit pound. All right. All right, thanks, Lenny. I'm so staying on the um, on the two occasions when uh, the existing sewer pipes were put in. Um, were there any pipe ruptures during construction? No, the majority of them were put in at one time. There were two or three that were put in on a later time. Okay, so there were so there were something like eight in, and then they installed another two or three. There were two in, and then they installed eight. So, and, and the biggest concern is when the contractor is going out to install this, there's no way to magnetically locate these lines or actually locate these lines subsurfacely without having to actually excavate it. So he's going to go through there and he's going to try to find this. And these lines are, I understand they're inch and a half lines. There's a couple inches in between them. By the time you're done, your, your, your pathway there is about four feet um, with, with all these lines. You have a one inch line, two, uh, a, a couple inches in between and then another one inch line. It gets, it gets quite large. So if one of these lines were to rupture, there's no way, there's no identifying feature on this line to even necessarily be able to identify precisely who it belongs to. There's no shutoff valves that are installed along this line. So that way they can they can shut this off. So potentially they can hit this line here and, and, and have sewage coming up into the ground, uh, uh, coming yeah, through. Yeah, I mean, look, people dig in the street with high pressure gas lines. Typically what you do is you dig with the machine until you get to the depth that's on the plan. Then you hand dig, then you hit sand. When you, when you, when you start excavating sand, you know you're near the, the lines. Under, under, understand, Chairman Maggio. We've been doing this. I've been doing this a long time this. as well. I've been doing this. I, I understand how this works. Um. It hasn't hasn't been brought up yet, uh, Chairman Burt. But I, I do think that that you know part of the argument is also um, how long it would take for the process. That was part of the paperwork that was submitted as well. But I think. Uh, part of the pushback also is that there is that this would take, you know, three years for for them to complete putting the sewer line in. So that's also something I would want this expert to sort of give us some feedback on actual, you know, timing of the of the event as well. Yeah, well, I and and that argument sort of depends on whether whether we're talking public or private, right? I've I've. I haven't asked much about public because I, I, I read that and I don't have a lot of questions about it. Um, I understand that the, the existing homeowners might be attached to their existing private lines and not want to give them up and therefore might be uh, resistant. Um, the, the, the argument about getting the easement just sounds very different to me when we're talking about a, a private line. They're going to they're lay their own line. Everybody else has already. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I could, not I, I am so sorry. I just I just want to confirm the call in number of the consultant because I, I otherwise don't know who. Um, who it's to what do you got? I think it's um it's either seven two eight. Okay, great. That's correct. Okay, Mr. Mr. Jackson is able to join us. Can you, can you finish your thoughts on, on what we were just discussing? Yeah, I was I was just going to say that the the road is a, a private road, as we've said, but not all homeowners on the road have sewer lines. So this isn't a situation where everyone else has one 
and we're seeking to get one. Um, this is a case where there are a select number of homes that have them and we provided you with that map to, so that you can see that. Um, so, you know, the road, we would need permission from a private corporation and not all the members of that corporation have private sewer lines. So it's not as easy as, well, you have one, we want one too. Um, and then hence the two years of discussions our, our clients and the applicants have had with all of these members, you know, trying to gauge interest and trying to get support to do this, to do a sewer. And, and really, it's just not amounting to anything. And, to, and so to do a public sewer or to let somebody buy one of theirs. Any sewer. They've also looked at doing a private sewer as well. But that also requires permission from the, the road corporation, a third party, and, and the applicant can't control what the third party decides to do. I mean, they've had discussions with them, but to an extent, you know, that, that's a that's an entirely different entity. Okay. Well, has, has the, the private road corporation said no? Um, the private road corporation has some serious concerns and, and I will let uh, the applicant speak to his discussions with them about whether or not they'd be supportive of a private sewer line. Um, so you're hearing directly from him and we, we can do that maybe after you hear from Mr. Jackson. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Lenny, are you there? I believe it's star six to unmute. Can Mr. Jackson hear us? Because if he can hear us, he's halfway there. Amber, can you unmute him as the host? I can only ask to unmute, which, I, which I've clicked several times. If, if anyone from his team perhaps wants to email him, um, that would be helpful. Is he at least on the line, but just can't speak? That, that's what I understand. I understand that this 631 number is um, the consultant, Lenny. Amber, 631-728-6148. Six three one seven two eight two seven four eight is what. All right, it's probably a landline. Okay, let me see. Um, in the interest of just moving things forward, um, I'll ask at this time uh, Bill Fadina, the applicant, to comment on his discussions with the Road Corporation. I think that would be helpful here. Mr. Fadina, you have the floor. Thank you, commissioners. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. I can hear you just fine, yes. Perfect. Yes, so in our November meeting, I shown the timeline and uh, you've seen a lot of the information we submitted. So we'll have the house in June of 2018. And now I can't hear you. And now we've lost your audio, Bill. So I tend to pride myself on being somewhat tech savvy. Is this better at all? Uh, yes. Yes, I can hear you again. Okay. So June of 2018, we bought the house. In August of 18, we started talking to the village engineer at that time. And in September of 18, we had the first road corporation meeting. They meet once annually. It's 19 of our neighbors. And so her, Hernani, that village engineer at that time, very clearly said, we're not approving any private lines. It's a disaster for maintenance. We don't know how, if there's a code 53, who's gonna respond, we don't know the lines. You know, and I know you have a lot of private lines, you can't connect to one or share one because that's deemed a common line, that's a public line. So that kicked off a process of how can we get a public sewer line or frankly, any sewer line since he eliminated the private sewer line approach. So over the next um, 
I said a year and a quarter. Um, we had the road court meeting in September. I presented, I said, here are my intentions. I'd like to get a sewer on the road. And that kicked off a six month process where I paid a lot of money to J.A. Kirby, the, the, those as built engineering plans you've seen. I had to pay every single party that was involved from 2005 to 2007 to get all the information that you're all reviewing. Um, the village had no knowledge of any sewer lines on the road when I approached them. I provided everything I provided to you to them over the course of a six month period. I wrote a letter signed by four of my other neighbors in February of 2019, expressing my intention, expressing my intention to use, as Commissioner Maggio has said, that deemed extra sewer line to connect to that as some other neighbors, because it's already in the road and that would be a very nice solution. So what I had said, what I had said to them was, okay, um, I have a few neighbors who looked at this, the road corporation. Um, and so I, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to speak to all of our private conversations, but the, in a sentence, if whatever is done to beneficial, is beneficial to all neighbors or doesn't negatively impact all neighbors, there is a lot of support to do something. The reality was in 2005 to get those five homeowners, which had nine sewer lines, to get that approved, one of the biggest things was that that extra sewer line was installed so that any neighbor that didn't have the financial means, the ability at that time to join could connect to that sewer line later. That was the single biggest reason all the neighbors agreed to do it. And obviously it was somewhat crushing when I presented in 2018 and all the neighbors were on board and said, yes, we would very much uh, be in favor of using that extra sewer line. And the village engineer responded very promptly saying, noted on that extra sewer line, but it's a violation of code to use it. So that set off a lot of different iterations of how can we get a sewer line? Um, the answer was, could you do a, a public line? Could we do a private line? Again, they said, no private lines are being approved now. And, and uh, uh, Commissioner Burt, as evidence on timing, uh, as, as a litigator using the concept of a precedent, a homics road, started looking to put in a private line and a public sewer line in 2017, and that's still not even done. So we can obviously have a consultant opine on timing, but that's a very live example of something that started in 2017 is still not done. Um, so throughout 2019, what I, I continued to do, I can be told no a, a fair number of times and try to rationally come up with a solution. So I went and tested uh, the hydrostatic air pressure test on the sewer line with the permission of my neighbors who own it. Um, as a way of saying, well, maybe there's a solution where we can still use that line and could we um, maybe get the health department to give a variance that we can have a public line and a private line all together. And so even being told no ahead of time, paid, did that test, the line came back satisfactory and told again, that was good, good job, but I'm sorry, no. The reason it was a no was if there's a report that needs to occur, and Rich Cordon from James, he said, want to have a uh, uh, hidden line when you're repairing the line, but very specifically, uh, Mr. Fadina, your voice is becoming your voice is becoming pixelated. Uh, if you could slow down, that might help. Sure. Trying to move closer to the um, microphone, if that helps. Thank you. I will, I will talk slower. And so he said, well, to make this happen, you have to cut all of the private sewer lines, lines cap them, and they can never be used again. And that's that's an untenable solution for our neighbors. That would be considered negatively impacting them. So I said, what if we somehow um, made the line curve 
around uh, the manholes, put in a new manhole. So, so maybe I want to repair the key junction. Um, we could use this again as a line. Uh, the answer was no again, because they said, what if there was an issue not at the manhole, some other part along the line, and in repairing the line, we damaged any of the other lines. That would be a catastrophic uh, event for sewage and leakage, but also monetarily for the village. So we went through a bunch of this, and it ultimately came down to, okay, well, what if we just build a public sewer line? Because private line was ruled out public line, brand new one, new trench. So we even had calls with the other utilities, Westchester Joint Waterworks saying, hey, because if you, if you look at the right, um, right away survey uh, was provided, again, we, that is a not cheap, very expensive survey we paid just to see if we could map the entire road and everything on the road. You'll notice that that exhibit was uh, submitted as well to the, uh, this committee you'll see that on that survey, there are setbacks between utilities, um, obviously water and then gas, but more importantly, you'll see the sewer lines cross under the water line where Grecian Point Road sort of dog legs to the left. And when it, where it does that, Westchester Joint Waterworks was, uh, uh, um, Rich, you were on the call, they, they were basically very hesitant to allow any crossing of the line without concrete casing the line. So the concrete casing is the solution because you can potentially engineer around everything. But then we said, okay, let's say we could figure out an engineering solution, like purely engineering. Then if we put in a public sewer line, I still have to have 11 of my neighbors uh, kill their, their private sewer lines, which is somewhat of an insurmountable ask um, for no other reason than They've had them for years. They paid a lot of capital for it. And they, some of them even have spare lines. Um, and without doing that, I, I don't know property rights, but I don't know if someone could seize them and with just compensation. I, it, it's the fact that it's not just a neighbor taking a line. As they're a voting member of the road corporation, they can block the people of the road to do that because you have to dig up the road to put in a public line. So it's a confluence of all these factors that ultimately we said we're giving up. It'd be nice after this year and a half to get this done. Let's go to septic. And and I think you you now know since I first talked in April. Yes, we designed a certain house that I thought was nice for our family, and respectfully didn't know a lot about the rules of consistency and how it worked. And we for literally every change since April was to try to appeal to the committee's interpretation of consistency and get with the unique circumstances here. And ha happy to answer anything, of course, about the sewer process. Uh, I just think it's important to know that I did spend tens and tens of thousands of dollars and lots of time way in advance to try to get any sewer with the village. Um, and I, I admittedly, I, I failed. Um, and what you helped do is shine a light to a lot of parties. I've talked to a lot of my neighbors over the last couple months as well. And it, it basically re-highlights that there are a lot of you know, views on how things should be done on a very, very local level, on the village level, a county level. And um, the, the feasibility of everything is something we've really struggled with. So that's why I obviously appreciate if we could work through you know, finding consistency in this very unique example. All right. Thank you for walking through the timeline. I understand we're we're now able to get Mr. Jackson on. Hello. Lenny, can, Lenny, can you speak again? Yes, here I am. What can I do for you? Mr. Jackson, this is Thomas Burt. I'm uh, the chair of uh, Harbor Coastal, and we've been uh, I've we've reviewed the um, the letter of uh, December 30 and the report of uh, December 29, and we wanted to hear what you have to say about. Uh, I, speaking for myself, I'm most interested in in the feasibility of uh, running a new uh, private line from 1165. Uh, if you could speak to that and uh and i'll i'll sort of flesh out questions as we go well my my input was regarding the uh 
the uh, flood elevations and the effect of this construction on, on Greece and Point Road oh. on uh, flood elevations. And the reason I was asked to consult on that is because I prepared the the flood insurance uh, study update for Westchester County as a as a consultant to FEMA. And I'm not familiar with what line uh, you're talking. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, we've we've been going for a while on on some related issues, and I asked you the wrong question. You're the you're you're the flood elevation person. Uh, well, I so, am I am an engineer, so if you if you can outline a, a question for a problem for me, I'll try to help solve it for you. We've we've been we've been talking about the, this proposal, and it requires uh, in order for them to get the the septic tank that we've been the septic system we've been talking about. They their their current need is 400 cubic yards of fill this yeah. is a this is a floodplain the actual not the fill but the act but the much of the construction is within the 100 foot buffer for the uh for the wetland our commission has typically um as, as you may know the village does not permit uh net fill in wetlands um yeah. That's obviously a, a, a rule for riverine flooding that doesn't really admit of exceptions. Um, when our commission has looked at the no net fill rule, we have been extremely reluctant to allow net fill even in coastal circumstances. And we, when we've admit, allowed um, net fill in a, on a coastal property that is in a floodplain, we've... Yeah. In, in recent years only allowed it on the parts of the property that are not themselves in the floodplain. Um, yeah. Can you explain to me uh, what is different about this property that we should allow net fill in a floodplain that doesn't open us up to uh, people essentially, essentially using the, using the, the, the fill and build island plan to put development uh, of a more intense kind into the most uh, coastal facing and sensitive areas that we've got. Okay, let me let me uh, expound on that. First of all, the, the wetlands, fill in the wetlands is an environmental issue. Uh, a wetland is not necessarily a floodplain, but a, a floodplain, in fact, could be a wetland as well. But this is not an environmental question, and I'm not an environmental uh, an eventualist. Uh, I do uh, hydraulics and hydrology. Uh, when you fill in, in, a, in a tidal flood area, um, there are certain areas where the fill may have an effect uh, on adjacent parcels, and, and that's called it's a VE zone. V stands for velocity. If you're in an area where the wave run, there's wave run up, and you build something in an area such as that, the wave could be deflected and affect adjacent properties. I looked at the FEMA maps, which which I prepared in 2007. At least I updated them for FEMA. Uh, and, and this property is not in a V zone. It's in an AE zone. An AE zone is, is, is a tidal zone in this particular instance. And if you place uh, fill in this, this area and specifically, uh, the tide will rise and fall, but it will not affect the elevation of the tide. And so this is, in this particular instance, you have a, a tidal zone with no velocity. There's nothing for me to analyze. Uh, and it's not an environmental issue, I, I presume, uh, because that's a different matter altogether. But in this particular location, uh, if you place a fill in this floodplain, it will have no uh, effect whatsoever hydraulically on the elevation of of the uh, of Long Island Sound. What's Okay, what's what's the five hundred year um, flood element? We've got the we've got the hundred year BFE, which I believe is thirteen feet here. What's the what's the five hundred year flood elevation? I don't have that at my fingertips. I didn't uh, I didn't know that, that I would have to uh, to look into that. But if you if you happen to have the flood insurance study available to you, um, you could just look at it and see. Right. And by the way, the the five hundred year flood elevation is a similar elevation in terms of uh, filling in this particular area, as long as it's not in a V zone and there's no wave run up, it won't have any effect on the flood elevation. You well, when you say it won't have any effect on the flood elevation, it's it's not going to change the elevation at the neighboring property. That's one right, change. Right. The 
It won't change it anywhere. Right. I understand that. So, yeah. but if you, but in a tidal zone, if you change the, if you change the grade, if it, in a tidal zone, if an area becomes inundated during a tidal flood and you yeah. change the topography, the, the velocity of flow both in and out can change, right? In this particular instance, because there's not an estuary where you could actually constrict the flow up the estuary, um, in this instance, it's open and therefore it will have no effect. Well, I mean, if you, if you have two properties that, that, are, that are mostly filled in a, in, a, in a deeper valley that drops off, you know, four, five, six feet between them, then as a flood runs in or out, um, a lot of the volume is going to fall into that valley and that'll have an increased velocity, right? If this were, you're correct, if this were an estuary where, where there was a constricted flow rate, and as the tide, as the water elevation goes up, the the flow has to go up into the estuary. And yes, if you constrict to the estuary, uh, you would in fact affect the elevation. In fact, you might slow it down. You may lower the elevation in the estuary. Uh, but in this case, because it's wide open, there's no effect one way or the other. But it's true. If you had a long estuary and, and it was uh, tidally affected, like the Hudson River, and you constricted the uh, constricted the the inflow of the tide, you'd actually reduce the elevation upstream. Well, I mean, even on even on beach sand, right? If you if you if, if you build two big platforms with a with a V between them, the water will flow faster in the V, right? Oh yeah, but you create what you're doing is you're creating an estuary. That's not the case here, right? Okay, you're, yeah. and and you're saying that Phil here won't won't elevated enough above the neighboring property to create that effect. And it will, will not affect it at all. Have, have you analyzed that if, if it would be relevant to on, on a very micro level of just looking at the grade of this property and the next door property? It's frankly nothing to analyze if we're a V zone. And when you do, when you do these types of analyses, you do transects, which is sections. You take sections along the coastline, and then and that's how you do the analysis. In this instance, it's so wide open. There's there's nothing really for me to analyze. Well, just to push it to the absurd, to sort of prove the point, if you were to put a whole lot of fill on just this property, like a like you know, thousands of cubic uh, meters, um, would the next door properties be impacted? Not at all. Well, no, I, where I was going is somewhere else, right? You've, you've got a, Martin, you're on, you're on mute, but my, my question was, so if you, I mean, if you put, if you put 5,000 yards of fill on this property and 5,000 yards of fill on the neighboring property uh, and left a, and left a ravine between the two properties, that ravine would be an artificial estuary condition that would, that would have some high velocity, higher velocity water traveling through it as, as the tidal flood came in and out, right? Well, if you if you created that, but now you have to tell me what's behind. If you try to constrict the uh, the flow, the inflow of, of the tidal waters, and as the water rises, it does pass through this, let's say, valley that you've just created. Uh, you have to tell me what's behind that valley. Does, how long is the valley? Does it go upstream somewhere? In this instance, it does not. You okay, see. I hear what you're saying. Well, yeah, I, 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 my. <clears throat> Let me let me try and phrase this correctly. So, I, I think it's it's our commission's um, purpose to try and avoid well, it's to the no fill rule. However, you know, I, I think what this gentleman's saying is that if, if there's a singular instance of fill, it really won't cause an effect. But this singular instance of fill might cause a precedent that would create multiple instances of fill. And if there were multiple instances of fill, that would affect the 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 water the water flow. No, let's 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 hold it right there. Uh, <laughs> what I I'm not interested in precedents. I'm interested in, in the engineering of it. You could take that entire area of the coast, and out of all the neighbors, it doesn't matter. It's one it's one lot or ten lots or twenty lots. If you raise that entire coastline, if you build a levee on the entire coastline. 
you would not affect the tidal elevation. You would affect the delineation of the, of the flood because, of course, if you put in a fill, it's not going to flood anymore. You'd affect the delineation. You'd shift it, but it wouldn't change the elevation. So are we are we asking the wrong question? Maybe because I do agree that if you put some fill on a property in Mamaroneck, you're not going to change the level of Long Island Sound. Yeah. But um, but I, I, I am I, I I do feel like this answer is sort of a macro answer. Um, does it are, are there potentially micro um, impacts of fill decisions on individual spaces of property? You know, along Delancey Cove. Is that a question? Yeah, it was meant to be. Do you, I can try to rephrase it too. <laughs> Why don't you try to rephrase it? Okay, so um, again, I understand we're not going to change the level of the ocean with some fill, but is it is it really right that if you looked, you know, carefully at say one parcel of property, that a neighbor's decision to you know fill or cut, but to change, you know, the level of the that that neighboring property that it would really have no impact on during like a rain plus flood event um or any kind of you know whatever the most relevant flooding event you could imagine that it wouldn't change the velocity or location um of the water during the event for, for the neighbor that's correct it will not All right. Uh, Can I ask Mr. Jackson a question? The floor is yours. Thank you. M Mr. Jackson, how would you characterize the, the hydrology of, of the applicant's lot? In terms of what, what are the properties, what, what, are, what are the, what are the uh, properties uh, of that land uh, in relation to the water that, that, would, uh, that either falls on it or that would be put, put into it? This, yeah, I, as I said, this is, this is a wide open area. Uh, there's, no, there's no concern about constricting flows or, or, uh, or increasing velocities. Uh, th those are concerns, would, would, they occur on riverine properties, let's say. Uh, but in a, a, in a wide open tidal area, there are no concern because you can't change them by putting a fill on a property. If you were a wave runoff concern, then you might change something because wave, you could, as you can visualize, a wave hits the wall, it deflects and goes somewhere else. Uh, but this is not the case. This is a, a simply a tidal AE flood zone and the water slowly rises and slowly goes down again. There's, there's no concern about the, the transport uh, of the water up a tributary or out of a tributary. It just doesn't apply. It does not apply. Uh, the concerns about filling uh, the valid concerns in wetlands for environmental purposes, the valid concerns on riverine sites where if you place, if you place uh, a fill in a, uh, a floodplain and you displace floodplain storage, that in fact uh, increases discharges downstream of, of, of the, uh, on the waterway, on the river, that would increase the discharge. Uh, or if you place a fill somewhere along the stream, you can constrict the conveyance of the stream and by changing the conveyance of the stream, you change the hydraulics, and therefore you could raise the water surface upstream of the of the fill if you if you do it incorrectly. But in this particular location, because it's tidal and the tidal elevations go up and down on a roughly six hours, um, uh, and because it's wide open, you don't have to be concerned about how the water travels around the fill because it happens too slowly. And that's why in this particular instance, really, it's, there's, no, there's no effect that I can measure, that I can analyze if you place a fill on this particular site. Okay, but without, without the fill, this particular property, does, it have, does this particular piece of property have the ability to absorb water? Because, what, because I, 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 say, I say this because, because the back of the property seems saturated. And, and, yeah, and, I, and I would believe that that it that if, if you take saturated earth and add more water to it, there's no there's no other place for the water to go, other than over it, around it, or somewhere else, because the land as it currently exists is saturated. If it if it if it, if it reaches 100% saturation, it cannot take any more water. That water's got to go somewhere else. 
if we so is a about, portion of this land saturated most of the time? You could say, listen, we're talking about the rise and fall of a tide of Long Island Sound. And the, the, the fact that, that there's sand that's saturated and that it can absorb water, uh, and yes, it can. And when the tide rises, let's say the ground becomes saturated. And then the tide falls and, of course, changes the hydrology. But if you took that area and paved it in concrete and would not let it, uh, let's say, absorb, let's say it's dry, and then it, 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 once you pave it and make it impervious, as the, tide, as the water rises on Long Island Sound, the amount of water that's absorbed that can be held uh, by saturating this soil over a six-hour period up and down, is, is, I couldn't measure that. You will not affect the elevation of Long Island Sound by paving this site. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I understand what you said. Thank you very much. Well, uh, yeah. actually, actually, one second. So, Andrew, was was that was you were you asking that question in relation to the stormwater management and the, and the ability of the soil to be able to absorb the water that is going to be expelled from the stormwater management? Yeah, yes, I was asking about. I was asking that question in relation to the stormwater management and to the septic system, because both systems release water into the ground. I wasn't really that concerned about the elevation of Long Island Sound. I was, I right. was more concerned about the, the absorption ability of that, of that piece of property, which seems to me at a, at a satura saturation level of 100%, even at low tide. But I, I heard the expert. Okay, I just wanted to clarify because it sounded like it was, was while we still have Mr. Jackson on the phone, is there any other questions um, regarding flooding and erosion concerns as it relates to uh, neighboring structures, neighboring sites, this property? The um, I have one, uh, I think I know the answer, but I'd like to clear the record up a little bit on how um, Mr. Jackson's letter is worded. So the, the way that the third and fourth uh, paragraphs are worded, it, it, it sort of, to me, looks like it says, in order to safely develop this site, therefore, right after talking about the lowest floor level of the uh, construction being at base flood elevation or above, um, yeah. I just wanted to confirm that all of this fill is solely needed for the septic system and it doesn't have anything to do with the base flood elevation of the property, of the, the buildings. The uh, I, I yeah I, you're correct I believe in what you said the the requirement in New York State is that the lowest floor the lowest living floor level of any structure has to be two feet above the base flood elevation uh, and that's a FEMA that's a federal requirement that's adopted by the state actually the state added two feet of freeboard it doesn't affect it does it's not applicable to a septic system which is which is governed by other requirements by the, I think it's the New York State Department of Health and probably the local Department of Health. So you must elevate your, if you have a septic system, you must elevate that as well. And, and just to confirm with, who, with whoever can, because it may not be you, Mr. Jackson, but um, it is, is it solely the septic that's driving the need for 420 uh, cubic yards of fill? I'm sorry, I couldn't. You got garbled. Uh, I heard something about 420 cubic yards of fill. Yeah, is it is it only the septic system and not the um, house or garage or other uh, um, elements of the construction and, and the base elevation of those that's driving the need for fill? You'll, you'll ask the engineer who designed the site. The requirement is to elevate the building two feet above the base flood elevation uh that's the lowest floor of the building as far as that system there's a health department requirement for freeboard above uh, wherever your wherever your tile fields or your distribution pipes are i don't know exactly what the uh freeboard has to be it's probably a few feet as well famous to answer your question the fill is solely for the septic system here the property okay. was redesigned so we didn't need the fill for anything else and and just to follow up also, there's no proposed fill um, within the wetland here. I know that's something that we, we started discussing. So I just wanted to clear the record. Okay. Yeah, yeah. thanks, that was helpful for me. Yep, I, I was clear that there was no, no fill in the wetland, but it's uh, useful to say it again, thank you. 
Great. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jackson. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I've I've hit the items I want to hit, and I and the, and I think I at least have a good understanding of uh, what information I still need in order to be uh, ready to vote consistency. Uh, who else? Who else has got questions on uh, uh, Phil Septic Sewer? Before we move on, uh, Mr. Chairman, can I just get your list of things you need in order to determine consistency? Uh, the only things I still think I need to cast my vote uh, are that I I think I need my own. Um, I think the commission needs uh, an independent uh, hydrologist and an independent uh, sewer engineer. To be retained by the village. Right. Uh, aside from Keller Sessions, who's been reviewing this project. I, 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 just, I, I'm, I, I just have to voice a little frustration on behalf of the applicant since they've been working so closely with Keller Sessions here and, and they have had discussions about the sewer and about the stormwater um, to bring in another party on their escrow account. Uh, just I, I want to make sure the board fully considers the value of that here and the impact it'll have in terms of you know time delay. Understood, and that's a fair comment. And uh, I really always prefer to have an applicant uh, up in front of us for review as quickly as possible and get to the vote. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't introduce new elements unless I really needed them to know how I was going to vote. Understood, uh, Chairman Bird. I have, I have two quick comments I might make. You floor's yours, Seamus. So um, I, are we waiting on some information from the Westchester County Department of Health on the septic? I, I'd always noted that, and I just didn't know where that ultimately resolved and where we were at on that. We're working hand in hand with the health department and hope to have that approval for you guys so shortly. And then um, I made a comment, I think the last time that you guys were here and, and with the, you know, some time since then, I'll just ask it one more time and see if there's anything further to address. But, you know, we, we came from 1,700 cubic uh, yards of fill in July down to 1,100 in September, now at 420, um, I think since November consistently. Uh, each step along the way, if you go back, I think we were told there is no other way to get this lower. Um, is, is there a path to zero for you guys? Um, and Unfortunately, there's not. We've looked at this. There's a number of concessions that have been made by the applicant from lowering the size of the garage from a three-car garage to a two-car garage, from bulking up the, 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 the design of the foundation so that way it would be able to have flood openings and everything else as opposed to how it was previously proposed. There's no more grade around the house. If you look at the, if you look at the site plans, the only spot we're putting any material is for the septic system. And when you also look at the site plans, you'll see that there's no spot for us to effectively remove material to provide a, a, an area that is that would offset that fill that's being brought in for the septic system. We've gone so far as to actually place the proposed stormwater management area within the existing footprint of the existing um, garage to prevent us from having to uh, you know, bring fill in to backfill that when we change that grade. And we really, really have been working and we've sharpened our pencil as best as we can. And truly, I mean, you, you can see the site is, is, you know, we've just been chiseling away at it. And this is what we were, were able to prepare. You can see the only spot that there's fill here is for the septic system. Yep, that makes sense. Helpful. And, and I absolutely appreciate that and, and can see that. It's it, it really just the way that that question was answered previously at higher levels of fill that that I think required me to ask it again. So I, I got that. And then um, Mr. Mr. Cardone, can I just ask you a quick follow up on that? Yes, how, how did the old septic system work without fill? The the old septic system was in when we explored it and looked at it when the applicant bought the property. It, 
in very, very deteriorated shape. It was old clay tiles that were basically placed end to end. And when there was a camera inspection that was done and the report was circulated to the board, it was it was plugged solid. We I can't speak for how the system was operating at the time, um, uh, but I can say that it's it's no longer the, the condition that it's in now is not. I could you know, just I thought I, ask, uh, just a, a question about the because I've heard a couple comments. Were there? Do we know the date of when the existing um, septic system was in place? Nineteen fifty-three. Okay, so are there new regulations from the Department of Health? Yes, regulations have changed a number of times since then. Okay, because I was just wondering that might help address, um, you know, why wasn't it needed then, and why is it needed now? Yeah, I think we heard that. We heard that at the top that. Uh, that and any attempt to remediate would also have to bring it up to code gotcha. and code was quite different then uh but seamus hadn't finished just and just to very quick, quickly uh close out so i i think that in my mind you know that so, some sort of determination from the westchester county department of health on the septic is i think helpful before making a consistency decision um but i'd be willing to discuss that and then i i think we discussed this earlier i i just haven't really seen anything on the on the SWIP as far as a red line or Kellard session responses. So in, it, it, um, that so I think that's an open item. Maybe some of it's in the record, but I think some of it would need to be closed closed out for me. Esteban, would you be able to issue a memorandum stating that this the stormwater and the drainage comments have been addressed? Uh, yes, I can. And then any further comments from the last review that we did make, we can review and um, see that uh, all those comments have been addressed and then issue a, a formal memorandum. Yeah, so that'd be helpful. To, I think that the way I've seen it before, uh, I, I, I believe the last document's September 14th, but just to you know, note the open items from September 14th and their satisfactory resolution. Understood. Thank you, Esteban. Thank you. Okay. All right. That that is as far as I think we can take this discussion right now. Um, if anybody's got anything else, let me know now, or we're going to move on. Uh, in the interest of of moving forward next month, Mr. Chairman, the um, deadline for the the February meeting, I believe, is next Wednesday. Um, by that time, will we have an idea of the village's consultants um, for hydrology and, and septic so that we can work with them? Is there a, a deadline you'd like materials from us by since, you know, we, we obviously won't know before that who the consultants will be? I, I'm going to have to see how I'm going to have to see to this tomorrow as a priority item. And uh, then we'll have staff reach out to you right away. I greatly appreciate it. I, Thank you. I, I really do not want to see this extend any farther than it has to. I want to get get my record complete and vote this thing. So I will be I will have staff on to you tomorrow. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, commissioners, for your time tonight. Thank you. And we've we've now closed out the portion of our agenda that concerns 1165 Grecian Point. We can move to our um, our next item, which is the uh, first time review of 1025 Rushmore Avenue, the Orienta Beach Club proposal. Uh, does do, do folks need a comfort break before we launch into that? We've been going a while. I'm good to go. I like to be on. Okay. Mr. Spatz. Hey, good evening, everybody. Chair, commissioners. Uh, this is Andrew Spatz. Um, I thought I was logging on to the inaugural uh, ball this evening. I where, Where's everybody? We're in their tuxedos and, you know, fine dining uh, tire. Um, oddly enough, it's in the same place. <laughs> Everything's in the <laughs> same place. I know. Uh, while everybody's being elevated to Amber, how are you this evening? I just, um, I 
asked everybody on my team to raise their hands. Hopefully everyone's following instructions and Thank you. We'll have a full team here, full panel. While we're doing that, it's good to see some familiar faces and uh, some new faces. Love seeing participation from the community. So important. I agree with you, uh, Chair Bert. You said that at the beginning that the, this committee is for the community. So it's good to see new faces. Uh, all right. I think we have everybody on. Uh, again, Andrew Spatz, for the record, 650 Halstead Avenue, Suite 105. Mamaronic, New York, 10543, on behalf of the Applicant Oriented Beach Club, 1025 Rushmore Avenue, Village Mamaronic. Uh, and before I start my mini presentation, just broad overstroke of our uh, application, I just wanted to introduce a few people that are going to be speaking this evening. First, I have Peter Boschio, Senior Project uh, Studio JBD, Jefferson Group Architects, Nunzio, Pichersante. I have Richard Horseman, he's a landscape architect and site planner. We have uh, Michael Murphy, who I know everybody on this panel, I'm sure is familiar with, uh, Murphy Brothers here in the village of Maronick. Mark Sheehan, who is the general manager of Orient Beach Club, and Elo Comfort, president of Orient Beach Club. Hopefully I have not forgotten anybody. Uh, I feel like I'm giving a, a, a thank you for winning an, an award here. Um, but let me kind of give a brief overlay here. The application before you this evening is um, pending currently, obviously, with the planning board. And we started the process back on December 9, 2020, with uh, simply the replacement of an existing patio and installation of an overhang over the an existing elevated terrace. As many of you know, Oriented Beach Club has been present and very much an active part of our community for over 100 years and has been a private beach club facility with dining and recreational uses, including beach, boating, tennis, swimming pools, basketball, and platform tennis. Uh, by the way, something I just started doing over the whole COVID thing was you had to get outside. And I, yes, I'm finally able to keep up with my kids with that. Um, during the course of improvements, the existing patio, and this is inclusive of the walks and steps would be replaced and increased only by 692 square feet. Uh, but it would include a water and retention system where none currently exists. And I think that's an, a very important point here. Uh, the stormwater management plan has been designed with the 2015 New York State Stormwater Management Design Manual. The improvements will enhance the functionality and flow of the existing exterior patio. The patio will be fully handicapped accessible, which is not, it is not now. And the net area that we're discussing is actually located away from the neighboring residential property. So if I'm looking from the waterfront towards the building, on the right side, there's one residential home, which is Mr. Verney, John Verney. And they, they being my client, the club have intentionally moved and placing this additional square footage on the left side of the property, which is closer to uh, the Westchester Day School. Now, obviously, uh, this would not have any negative impacts for um, Mr. Verney or the uh, or the school because the school are Monday through Friday and during business hours or school hours from 8 to 3 p.m., hopefully, God willing, in the year to come. Um, with the change of circumstances. And so there won't be a competing use here. When the club's using it, it'll be during the evenings and weekends when school's not in session. Equally as important, there'll be a new landscaping uh, added. And we have uh, an individual to speak about that. That's Richard Horseman. The improvements will also include the installation of an overhang, which will permit greater use of the outdoor, outdoor patio during inclement met weather and given this pandemic, global pandemic, it provides additional options for outdoor down, dining. Um, the proposed improvements are indeed consistent with the 44 policies of the village local waterfront revitalization program. And just naming a few, the improved improvements, the proposed, excuse me, improvements will not cause any physical impacts, geological, vegetative, or structural to the scenic resources in the immediate vicinity of the project. 
along with the stormwater management and enhanced landscaping, the improvements have been designed to uh, protect natural resources by minimizing any potential erosion and controlling stormwater. Um, again, there is no currently, currently there's no stormwater retention present and there are no issues with runoff or uh, obviously with um, erosion. And with this small area, approximately 692 square feet of uh, structure being, or I should say of impervious surface being added we do have the luxury of installing the water system. Um, I am hoping that everybody got a package that reflected and showed the photographs of the as is condition. And you'll clearly see that the improvements will certainly maintain the natural serenity and ecosystem that you would find along uh, coastal property. Um, so we have everybody on board, uh, our architect engineer and landscaping, as well as uh, the management from uh, Orienta. So we're gonna throw it back to chair and members uh, commissioners for any questions so we can expand and explain anything that may have, we may have missed uh, in the application. Thank you, Mr. Spatz. I guess my first question is, your, your, the proposal is to add 692 square feet of impervious surface. Is, it, is, is that all impervious only because of the overhang uh, or Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Chair. The 692 is just inclusive of the um, of the patio. And again, our um, consultants and architect and engineer can discuss that in more depth. And I, that does not include the overhang. Um, there, I believe, and if correct me if I'm wrong, there is an existing uh, mark. Uh, there is an existing overhang now. Let me just, I'm just want to look at the pictures really quickly. Uh, not really, it's uh, just a small staircase. Okay, all right, so it's a small, so no, that's not, uh, Chair, that's not inclusive of the um, overhang, but it's indicated that the, the overhang, overhangs an area which is currently impervious. So I guess it's, it's actually kind of what chicken before the egg or egg before the chicken. So you have an overhang over an existing right that's that's net zero an impervious right, 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 overhang right, right. over an impervious an existing impervious surface exactly all of the added 692 square feet of impervious of new impervious surface is a, is additional uh patio fair enough Had, yes i guess patio the, the 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 first item is uh, what's under that patio area and could you do uh, could you create that patio with pervious surface that's definitely way above my pay. That's well above my pay wage. So uh, I'm going to pass that off sure, to our experts. That's why you pay people well, that can answer. That. <laughs> I, 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 I can could do a bill that. application, the chair, but this one, I'm going to defer to our experts. Go ahead, gentlemen. Uh, I could answer the question. As far as the impervious surface, uh, do you all have the uh, the site plan drawings, SP-1, SP-2 available? Have you looked at those? I have, and I'm about to look okay. again because you're going to walk me through something. I think. Sure. Yeah. Chair, exactly. would it be helpful if we did the screen share, or, or, or do you want to utilize it on your end? Uh, I think I can get this. What? Where my site plan is the second. If you, if you go to yeah. site plan one, that kind of shows the, the the difference between the existing layout and the proposed. Just I'm just opening the. The document now. Is that SP one or is that uh, which SP one? SP like? one. Yeah, SP one. Okay, great. Is, is the calculations on the impervious surface? Um, I mean, I could try screen share if you want. Uh, I can. I, I have the plan up in front of me. I'll click the button and see what happens. All right. Oh, do you guys see it? Yeah. I see. Uh, it looks like I think bridge, the kids. Good. Go. I got, got, yeah, I got school pictures. I got, school pictures. Wrong screen. You yeah, shared your desktop. Oh, okay. Desktop, okay. not site plan. Great Is smiles, it? though. Very good smiles. Uh, yeah, that's my granddaughter. There we there go. go. There you go. You got it now? I put it on. I have a yes. dual screen. Do you have it now? There's SP1. Okay. I see it. Yep. Okay. So if you see here, A, uh, the, the existing terrace, the yep. distance from the, ex the existing sun porch rear wall to the point where the concrete planters, the kind of old 
outdated concrete planters that are only for seasonal plant, uh, you know, seasonal flowers or whatever. Um, that distance remains the same as far as the impervious surface area. The, uh, not the impervious surface, the distance from the rear wall to the edge of the pavers where the uh, curtain drain and the planting area starts. The main increase in impervious surface because this, this roofed over upper terrace here, that's already obviously impervious as we discussed before. The main, <clears throat> the main increase is this area down here on the proposed plan where we're putting a handicap ramp and extending the area to come down from the stairs and a, a couple of steps here and then a, a handicap ra accessible ramp here. Um, so this, this piece right here is the majority of the additional impervious surface. There is a little bit here where we're removing these stair the, the stairs on the existing and we're bumping out a little bit here, if you can see here. Uh huh. Sure. And then okay. the other the other increase is obviously since we're cutting this this stair out, we have to reconfigure the walkway to connect to the existing paver walkway. Uh -huh. So the, the new stair to the lower area, this makes up the balance of the additional impervious surface. I kind of labeled it down at the bottom. Uh, yes. So that's the the explanation on where the impervious surface comes. As far as permeable pavers. Um, if you if we go to um, drawing SP SP two is the is the existing as it is uh, these are the details here's SP four which is the proposed plan mm -hmm. the current the current terrace basically sheet flows out out from the back of the uh, sun sun porch to Pass, it goes through the planters, I guess, in the joints between the planters and then out into the grass area. There's no detention system at all. Mm -hmm. What we're proposing to do is basically pitch everything this way, but then along the, uh, we have a little edge curbing here, which will be flat with the, with the pav paving stones. <clears throat> and it'll be pitched from here back to this. There's a, a little catch basin here, like 12 inch plastic catch basin and a plastic catch basin here. So the water will, will come down, flow into this, into this curtain drain as a detail. It's basically crushed stone with a perforated pipe. It'll go into this catch, I'm sorry, I, this catch basin here. And then, uh, and then on the other side, on the north side, on the south side, uh, it'll go from here into the water quality basin and then Everything's going to be at uh, uh, this will be at a lower elevation. Then it'll flow into the storage storage basins. By some chance, if 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 uh, and this was over designed to begin with, um, any any backup storage. I mean, if we get a, a torrential rain that lasts for a week or whatever, anything that gets filled up here will go go through a, a four inch relief pipe which will basically discharge onto the existing grass, which is where it went anyway. But that probably will never see water coming out of that. Um, so uh, as I said, you know, most Again, of I don't want to interject. And again, right now there is no- uh, There is no drainage system. system right. And, and, and by and the way, even with the roofs, um, there are a couple, there's the, the new roof gutters, there's existing gutters here. But we're going to capture this roof, and, and you can see the line here going into this water quality. So we're picking up the roof also. Okay, that, and that's a that that's a, a clear and, and useful discussion of what you're proposing. Um, it it is not, however, an answer to what I asked you, which was um, could you use uh, could you could you, could you build a permeable terrace here instead? Well, they, they are accepting it um, in, in, in a lot of municipalities now. Certain systems like, um, what is the, the, can't think of the name offhand, the one that's always advertised on television with the guy with his family in the pool there. You're talking about Armatech? Yeah, yeah. Armatech, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, they do make an approved, what's considered and classified based on the definition in the industry as a permeable paving system. It's got different layers of crushed stone below, and but it, it basically accomplishes the same thing we're doing here. 
just to be which just is to be basically clear. storing the water in the ground because that allows the water to percolate into the into the crushed stone base over a wider area but it's a you know it's basically doing the same thing and only certain i mean there are some details that you can develop but only certain manufacturers have had things approved where it, it is de determined to be the the uh, surface runoff number the cn number is determined to be i see you, Martin. below the level of what's considered permeable uh, impermeable Okay, so, so it, it can be done, but we're accomplishing the same thing right. by putting by putting the um, this perimeter. This is all a perimeter drain here, which I'll show you the detail right here. Uh, this is the this is the pavers down at the bottom. Detail five. Let me get okay. It okay, so this will be the edge. That's the paver. This is the curbing flush, and then <laughs> we have a concrete cradle for it. And then this is going to be your your curtain drain where the water flows down, goes into this pipe, and then into the into the detention system. And the plantings are going to be here, located over here, I, which will further absorb the water. I, yeah, I I got what you're doing. Uh, I I've got what the proposal is. I um and part of what we do here is uh, make sure the applicant is considered alternatives. You know, I I see a number that has a a positive increase in impervious surface. The first obvious question is. Well, could you do that with no increase in impervious surface? And uh, and the answer I just heard is maybe. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that um, you're going to have to consider uh, whether a a pervious an, a, a pervious surface option is a is a better way of skinning this cat. I know for sure that uh, Commissioner Hain has a question now, so I'm going to hand the floor to him. Thank you, Thomas. Um, can you go back up to the uh, to the to the to the layout? On, the, on which drawing? Right there. That's good. Okay. okay. So so um, I, I appreciate uh, you know when, when you went through this explanation, if you compare this one to the to the to the existing, uh, it looks like that the um, the the drainage system that you proposed here covers the area of where the existing is, but there isn't anything that addresses the additional area that you're adding on the left and on the right and the additional walkway as far as the runoff from those areas. Well, usually, I mean, this, this, this area here is what we're talking about here. Well, yeah, I mean, we're basically talking about the additional 692 well, square this, feet all, of, all of, <laughs> Yeah, all this but right please, side. Please let, please let me finish my sentence. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so, sorry. so we're talking about the additional 692 square feet. So the drainage system that you've proposed here does not address that additional 692 square feet. It addresses the existing patio. No, that's not. Uh, uh, that's not really correct because the actual drainage system. If I go back to, let me get the design here. Let me blow it up. Martin, you're on mute again. Sorry, the way you explained it was that the okay. Pitching so, would go, so would, if you look at the, the yeah, if you look at the calculations over here, um, the actual and I give a little narrative. Uh, we're actually approximately five thousand slab perforation rate. So what we're doing is we're actually holding for over twelve hundred and ninety-two square feet because we're picking up some of the roof areas. So we're doing more than the 692. So if we may not be capturing, as you're saying, the piece, it was this P. We, may, we, we will be capturing, and let me scale this down. We will be capturing all this area up to, up to the top of this ramp here, right here. Right, but to the left of that, and we'll be ramp, we'll capture. The left we won't be ramp, capturing this, but oh. to the left, to the left of that, of where you just drew that line, is where you're adding the permeable, the new permeable service. Where, where here? Yeah, the way you described it is you're adding a new yeah. ramp. And that, and well, the, yeah, the the bump out from the existing really is if, it, if I trace this is like this this piece right here. Right. So how are you handling okay, a lot of it? Is, a lot of it is grass. 
a lot of it is grass area. So <laughs> Nunzio, again, if I can, Nunzio, it's Andrew Spatz. Yeah. I just want to interject for a second. I, I need, and I, I'm hoping that everybody takes into context the area with which the back of Orienta provides between the clubhouse and the beach or the waterfront itself. The area is absolutely tremendous in square area footage. So the 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 walkway, which Nunzio was making reference to, that's certainly not 692 square feet. You're talking maybe 90 to 250 square feet of additional walkway, which could easily, easily be uh, addressed by the mass uh, mass area of grass, vegetation, and existing uh, soil. So I, I, I think that that, with re respect to the walkway, that they're just altering, you know, making it more accessible, especially for handicapped um, purposes. It, I think the immediate area has more than enough ability to um, entertain and adjust for the uh, impervious surface. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, um, I'm not understanding. So from, I'm going from your initial explanation, which, which was that the additional 692 square feet was being added to the left side and the right side of this, of this, of this patio. And so when you look at this drawing and you look at the way this, this system is designed, it does not show drainage or water, or water uh, runoff mitigation for the left side or the right side of this patio. Commissioner Haynes, on the right side where there's this, the service station where you see 108, um, Nunzio, move it back up to the right where the service station is. Yeah, I believe here. that's being expanded upon. And if, and if you look to the left it flows of here. One, in 105 it, on the upper terrace, that's also being expanded upon. So it actually does address the, I think the larger area of, um, if you want to refer to it. It addresses all, Andrew, it addresses, if you follow the arrow here, it goes around these stairs. So let's say the stairs and this piece go down here. Everything else is meant to flow this way. So basically from here and around here, this would be the only area that we're not capturing because everything else is going to flow in this direction to, to this drain and to that drain. So this service area is going to flow down into the, into, the, into the planting area, into the curtain drain and basically go into this catch basin and it's gonna flow from here to there and from here to there going into these pipes and going into the detention system. So again, the only, if you cut a line through here, this is the only area, which is probably around 250 square feet. If you look at the, the th that totality there. Um, and again, this is all existing grass area down here so that would just come by sheet flow and get absorbed in the grass. Remember, I, I had said that the system is has been designed for sixteen for twelve hundred and plus square feet, which is double what what the net increase is because we're picking up some of the existing roof also that really never went anywhere. It came out through and onto the terrace. Okay, thank you. You didn't explain that pitching before from from the left and the right sure. side. Okay, so, okay. So that that answers that answers the question. I apologize for that. Okay. All right, so that's a little clearer. I, I had a, a, a few other items I want to talk about. Um, what You just said it's a vast area, and I, I know roughly what it looks like, but what's the distance uh, from the new construction to the water? To the water? Uh, let me see. I, I had it in my notes somewhere. Um, if, you, if you look here, this is the existing, which, which I said basically, if you see the hatching here, that's going to be the, the planting area, more uh -huh. or less. But from this point, from this point over to the, to the, um, I don't know if that's the, that's the property line. And then I have one to the mean, I think I put to the mean high water level, it's 110 feet. And this is 90 feet. Okay, so none of this is within the 100 foot buffer. Well, it, it does the next, uh, I, was, I was wondering that too. I was looking at the survey. Is the next- That's existing as it is. Yeah. Um, is the next um, page that you had that you flashed to with a minute a minute ago with some you know purple and teal lines, is, is that the survey or yeah? That's the survey, yeah. yeah. This I think shows the wetland line. I didn't see the wetland buffer line in it. 
Let me let me blow. Buckland Buffer is the farthest dash blue line. That's the beach. Right there. Wait, that's it right there. Right here. Right here. That's it right there. There is tidal wetland. That's the tidal, right tidal, tidal wetland line. Okay. Cause th so there's a there's a hundred foot buffer from tidal wetland. Um and I don't I don't see the buffer line marked. We're gonna need that. Okay. But again, as I as I said, over here where we're extending right here. Where where I mean I could show you the distance, but this is way over a hundred feet where we're extending this area. And right here is gonna be the, the same. The only thing we're doing here is put it, you know, bumping out a little bit right here where where the existing stairs are, which is already basically impervious surface. Mm -hmm. uh, right. I'm, be, I'm just yeah, you know, scroll yeah. in the review, we're telling you what you're gonna need. We're we're okay, we're gonna so you want to that input, you want that buffer. step back. Wetland buffer 100 line. Hundred put wetland buffer, so we can look at it because that has implications. Among other things, uh, if you do anything within the hundred foot buffer, you need an environmental consultant uh, to make a record that there will be no negative impact to the protected wetland from the work inside the buffer. So it's important to show that on the map so that we know whether we're talking about any disturbance inside the buffer or you're all you're doing work entirely outside the buffer. Okay, and that's from the tidal wetland line. Okay. Yep. And I think tidal you know, wetland any, line. Any um any cut fill and um <laughs> that was my next question. Yeah, okay. and, and and impervious calculations would be helpful yeah. to know what's inside the wetland buffer and what's outside. And yeah, that's where I was gonna go, Thomas, whenever we were getting there. I didn't <laughs> if, yeah, that was my next checkbox item. I if if anybody watched the last um applicant, you know that we we have um we, we have re recurring issues with um, the net fill rule and um, it, your life is a lot easier if there is no net fill in a floodplain. And, and um, I didn't see a grading plan at all here, but I could easily have missed it. A lot of materials here and first time well, we'll look at this. The, 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 uh, the proposed and existing elevation spot elevations are shown. Uh, we, got, we did get a, an updated this this survey was done recently, I think, as you can see by the date on it. But um, what what's happened? What's going to happen here is basically the excavation that we have from from the Caltech units that are going to be installed over here is what's going to be used. To, you know, once we get rid of the uh, the planters, is what's going to be used around the the uh, perimeter to you know it's basically a cut and fill. We're excavating and, and using it. The only thing that's going to be added would be the topsoil to address the planting area. Obviously, you just can't put that material in. You got to put six or eight inches of topsoil there. And I guess the, the landscape architect could address that better when he gets to go over okay. his planting. So it so sounds the like the answer is zero. I, I, I believe, yeah. Chair, I think that's what you're zero. asking. Is there a net change? And I don't believe there is. No. That right. is very helpful. Thank you. Great. Uh, I, I heard that, sure. I, 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 we were watching the previous <laughs> application, so I made a note on my yellow pad too on that. And Andrew, the the more you know, the, the easier that all that can be laid out for us, the better, right? To show the lines, to show the calculations, to show the calculations inside and outside of the wetland buffer is is great. Commissioner Work, you're talking to me, Andrew, or Andrew Maggio? <laughs> well, I'm, yeah. talking, I'm talking to you. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I just want to make sure I wasn't just, okay. just because I think that you know, obviously, we need the wetland buffer line added, and then you know, throughout the throughout the site plans and construction plans, where you can show grading, show the cut fill calcs in, uh, impervious and make the distinction between the um, wetland buffer versus not is, is always helpful, I think, when, when so, that's broken into yeah, components. Obviously, if, if when I get the, the distances there and show it to the existing and also to the to proposed, if it's, if it's over 100 feet at any point, then it's a moot point. But obviously, if, if it's like 98 feet or whatever, you want that area calculation if there's any uh, encroachment. But uh, it'll probably, it probably will be no different from the existing and the proposed because this is, this is the part that encroaches out that might, you know, that, has, that is closest to this uh, tidal wetland buffer here. 
right? You're not I changing that, Nunzio, correct? That is staying the no, same. No, that's, yeah. So, I mean, it's 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 getting As over is. here widened out a little bit. There's a stair that goes in here, but that's where it gets a little wider. Um, and then the, the, the main part is over here, which is already far away from, you know, a good a good distance from here. But I'll designate all, all those dimensions for you for the existing okay. and proposed, and I'll tabulate whatever needs to be tabulated. Yeah, another thing that's usually helpful for us too is to have these lines laid over the proposed changes. Um, and no, not, I'll show that on there. Yeah, not, the yeah, not just the existing. Yeah, I'll show both. Okay. Okay. Good. Last thing on on my short list, um, view shed. So the the one area that we have absolutely defined as a view shed concern is if you can see it from Harbor Island Park. Uh, so one thing which and and you're allowed to do stuff that's visible from Harbor Island Park. The standard isn't no development. The standard is that we have to consider uh, its impact. But since we have to consider the impact of anything you see from Harbor Island Park and they can see this from Harbor Island Park, we're going to, I didn't see a, um, I, we're going to want to, we're going to want a, a, a visual or a rendition that's, that's that view, the distance view, so we can assess it in, in the light of the view shed from Harbor Island. Chair, if I just could clarify, um, this parcel faces the Long Island Sound. I, you can't physically, you. living in Orienta and always walking on Rushmore along the west basin, wet east basin of Harbor Island, there's no physical way to see this property from Harbor yeah. Island. I'm trying to think, even if you're on the beach, um, even if you're on the beach at Harbor Island, looking due southeast, you, you can't physically see it. So I just want to, so I can advise my clients accordingly. Okay. We could take pictures, but I, I and I, believe me, I understand uh, the concern, but you, you can't, physically, you can't see uh, this property, this parcel from Harbor Okay. Island. It might be useful. I didn't, it, and if I missed it, I'm sorry. If It, it no, might sorry. be useful to have an aerial just so we can assess that, you know, look yep. at it and have a record and say, it's actually not within the Harbor Island view shed. And you, you got it, uh, Chair. Not, that's easy. And I, I think maybe because I, listen, until just recently, I used to get this particular club confused with Beach Point, which one's which. And so I, I get that, but we can easily get an overlay, a bird's eye view from above. No, no problem. I'll get, that's I'll, easy. Andrew, I'll get, a, I'll get a, 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 an aerial map from the Perfect. county website and I'll show an arrow direction from Harbor Island so you can see the view line and you'll see what's in the way. But I, I just put up, you know, did you, got, you guys saw these pictures, right? I mean, we were talking about the grass area and I yeah. mean, anything that you see, even if you saw it, if you were able to see it, the final product, obviously we're going to have plantings all over here. And that's all going. We're taking all that down. Yeah, the, all the, of this, the, 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 that cement, it's going. Yeah. I mean, you can see yeah. it's, it's God knows, I, I don't know the year it was put in, but, you know, even a little bit of stone wall that's under here at this point, it's uh, certainly uh, going to be a, a, a better appeal. The, the architecture obviously is going to match the existing building, the stone and everything else. But, uh, you know, to have a planting bed here yeah. and, and, and basically, you know, and, and uh, 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 the landscape architect will, 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 dis will discuss that. But yeah, you know, a lot I, of that's going to be screened. Yeah, I, I, I mean, just I go, go ahead Mark. about this picture. So you can see that the elevation of the land changes on the right hand side of the picture. So if you're eliminating the wall, the retaining wall there, how, how are you going to be addressing that if the, you know, it, because it, it seems like the new plan makes everything even straight across. So is there going to be some fill? To, to no, there'll be a pitch. There'll be a pitch. Okay. And we'll, I'll, I'll finalize those grades for you so you can see it. But we'll okay, make a pitch and maybe, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll rebuild a section of this wall if we have to basically where these stairs are going to go right here. Is it going to go to the existing grade? So that'd be like, you know, uh, the, the cheek walls of the stairs and then, uh, you know, whatever we need to make up this grade right here. Okay, yeah, it would be helpful to see that, that view yeah. as well. Okay, it's, it's easier to, it's easier to, to sort of 
you know, know where we are with the view shed if if we know that it's not actually yeah, visible no, from sure. Island, Harbor Island Park. That really yeah, reduces guess how that much is, we have to think additional... about aesthetics. Yep. Um, okay. Thomas, yeah. Uh, real quick, I happen to be at the site with uh, Frank Tavolacci over the summer, and I can uh, verify that the, uh, the there's no view of uh, of Harbor Island from this back patio area. Uh, it goes right straight across to Long Island. Yep. Okay. So yeah, it's right. Now sure, that I'm sure, thinking I'll go about to Manhattan. I'll take a picture from Manhattan. Yeah. Of course, you're on Long Island. I'm just now, now that I'm thinking about where it is, I really. But yeah, I, I'd like to have an aerial just so that we can we can say sure. we've touched that base on the record. That you can't no see problem. it from Harbor we, Island. We got that. And, yeah, that's that's easy enough to do. Okay, I've run through my checklist of items. Um, Martin, you got anything else? No, thank you. Seamus, Lisa, Andrew. Not me. Um, sure, just so I can kind of round uh, third here. So mm -hmm. I have I have three items. One, could surface be a pervious as an alternative um, for the additional uh, sidewalk or walkway that we're utilizing? So rather than impervious, explore type of pervious surface. Uh, distance from uh, patio uh, to the waterfront or the wet, tidal wetland buffer line, you want to obviously <laughs> see that. Uh, any disturbance within that wetland area, and obviously the bird's eye view uh, of the property. So I have three particular items. And obviously I understand Martin, uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Hayne would like to see the, the grade outlines, which we will certainly, I'm making the note right there, we'll get that for you. Thank you. Uh, if, I, if I may, before we conclude, does anyone from the club, um, either Mark or Elo, would you like to address um, chair and commissioners. Well, before uh, before we do that, the the other thing that we, next time you're up in front of us, we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, you know permit checklists and any other uh, well, any other permits you need. So let's let's just sort of preview that. Yeah, I, I was gonna suggest that that that's a, I, I actually had that written down as well. I believe all is in order, but if you feel that we're missing something or we want something, then yeah, but let's flush that out because it'd be great. It'd be yeah. ideal because we probably won't come back before you until February. Okay, so yeah. That's by the next. time, yeah. AC, ACE, do you need anything? Army, Army Corps of Engineers, I don't believe so, but I'll double check. I don't believe so. Okay, uh, Department of State. Again, I don't. I don't think we meet the threshold for that, but I'll double check it. Okay. Uh, have you have you ticked the SHPO box? Is this a historic building or 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 um, eligible for listing? Okay. I'll have to check that. No, Jay, I think you did that. I, I think I, I, actually, I don't believe it is. No. But I'll, I'll double check on that too. That's one, two, three items. Yeah. Um. Well, do you need anything from the county? No, I don't believe. Okay, don't that's what. So. All right, that's that's what I can think of right away. Is, right. It, is there another permitting authority that we should that we should keep our eye on? If anybody can think of one, let me know. FEMA is. Mm -mm. You need to meet I, a. Yeah. I okay. I don't think we need anything from them. This is in a, a, a type X uh, zone, which is like 0.2 percent chance of a 500 year storm on okay. an annual basis. All right, so that's the short permit checklist. Um, and so I'm through my items. Well, actually, if we Hi, can, uh, Richard, um, can you just share maybe a little bit uh, with the vegetation and landscaping if, if you are still on? I, could, I can't see who's on and off, but uh, do you want to just Take maybe- Take go off on my screen or, yeah, because I don't have the landscape plan. No, I know, and I I, I know that uh, Richard spoke with our landscape consultant for the village, Susan Oakley. So I just want to make sure that the chair and commissioners are aware that we're very proactively taking care of the landscaping component as well. Because I know, I know some of the members back in flood mitigation advisory committee. We like landscaping. We like vegetation. So I want to make sure we have that covered. 32 square miles of Westchester County drain right into our harbor. If we don't yes, think about true. where it goes. This is true, and I was listening to you about that. Uh, Rich, uh, Rich, are you on, bud? 
Amber, do you know if he's, um, maybe he has his mute on. Let me see if I can see. Andrew, he might be a phone call. Uh, okay. Thank you. Richard. Oh, hi, sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. What is the name, R Richard? Yeah, Rich, um, Richard, but he may be on a phone number. I'll just give you the first two digits. Richard, two, he has no last name, so I don't know. Two, two, zero. Uh, Richard, I'm sorry, Richard, uh, I should know this by, by now. No, Horseman. the person. It's Richard Hosman. Oh, here, yeah. Listed. Two, two, zero would be the phone number. I, I just put through someone named Richard. I don't know yep. if that's your Richard. I Richard, you that, buddy? He's on, he's on mute. You know what I'm going to do? It, would it be acceptable to chair and the fellow commissioners to, um, I'm going to try calling him on my cell and try to hook him in that way, if that's okay. We can make it work. Can you, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, perfect. We <laughs> hear you, Richard. Okay, you can... <laughs> Sorry, you were the uh, you were the uh, microphone was being covered up. Uh, as long as they can be heard, I let me know. Let me say that I've been uh, talking and coordinating with uh, Susan Oakley regarding the uh, uh, appropriate uh, plant materials to be used in the plant bed along the edge of the lower terrace. Uh, the plant bed size will remain as shown on the drawings uh, that have been previously submitted or that you're, <clears throat> that you're looking at now. Uh, I'm adding uh, the plants uh, for that bed. Susan has given me the uh, plant list that is in the village code and additionally in discussing the plants with her, uh, she has indicated that uh, some native wetland area type plants can also be considered for this plant bed. I expect I'll have the uh, planning plan for her review in the next couple of days. And I'm trying to select the plants that will uh, remain low in height to minimize the amount of pruning that would need to be done and to keep the views open to the water and uh, plants that will have a seasonal color and interest along the edge of the uh, lower terrace. Um, I've <clears throat> assembled a plant list and it looks like we're going to have a fair number of uh, flowering shrubs and uh, some perennial uh, native uh, flowers as a combination along there. And that's the summary of the situation. Thank you, Richard. I have a quick question. So is, is the preference gonna to be towards native plants or is it gonna to be towards uh, ornamental? It's gonna be a combination of, uh, well, native wetland, anything that's been approved for a, a situation like this. Richard, Susan Oakley sent you a list, uh, correct? Yes, right. yes. She sent me a list and I've subsequently talked with her about the list and about expanding, being able to expand it for other plants that are not on the list, but acceptable for these kinds of situations. I just brought that up because uh, uh, our preference is always native plants. So if, if it could be all native plants, that would be definitely better in our in our eyes. So. Okay. Um, do any of my fellow commissioners have anything else? I don't think so. I think Wonderful. we. We can, we've taken this as far as we can tonight, and we look forward to seeing you back. Commissioner, just so I under, uh, I'm sorry, Chair, just so I have an understanding, we'll, we'll get these documents. We'll then circulate them back to Amber, who can circulate it to Chair and mm -hmm. fellow uh, commissioners. Um, we're scheduled, I think, to go back to 
planning um, in about two weeks. I, and my, my question to you is only because ideally uh, the club would love to start doing their project in uh, early spring with the thaw. If we are able to accomplish the, provide you the documents, which I know we will be by the next meeting, is it likely if everything falls into place, we could find a consistency on that uh, date? I would. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm I just... would dearly love to have more okay. applications that we can review for preliminary once, consistency once, vote and not see again. I would love okay. to make that happen. Wonderful, chair. In terms of okay. percentage chance, I can't tell you, but I can tell you <laughs> that I would dearly love to notch another two touch application. That well, would listen, I was going to ask you guys about the likelihood of the Mets making it to the World Series, so I was going to go percentages on this. But I guess <laughs> I, I won't. I, I would not opine. I I right. would really I would really like to to you know be able to say we had another two touch application. We reviewed it for a little We right. reviewed it for consistency. We voted it. Bye bye. Uh, that would be great. Great. We'll, we'll uh, do everything we can to get everything I, in order. I will tell you, we, we, we try to be as clear in communicating where our concerns are as we can be. The, the one thing we spent a lot of time talking about is whether it's possible to, um, to use uh, pervious surface as an alternative to mechanical water management. Um, really, either, either come with a record that lets us say, okay, they've fully considered that and what they've proposed is a better way to do it, or come with a record that says, when we looked into it, uh, you know what, actually, we have a better idea. Um, but come with a record that lets us say we're done with this issue. It gets us to a vote faster. Understood. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Good to see everybody. Any, anything else from my Thank team? You. Anybody? Okay. I think I'm out. Thank you for your time, Commissioner. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Folks. Have a good night. Thanks so much. Have a good night, everybody. You too. Well. Good night. Now I just have to figure out how to get out of here. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be stuck with you all tonight. All right. Good night. All right. Let's see. All right. I don't think we have much to talk about with 652 Shore Acres. That was uh that was put over to the next meeting um amber are we waiting for something on that do we know why they kicked it uh the applicant requested to adjourn I, yeah I, I'm, I'm asking a different question do we do asking, are are they waiting why? for um and and i i guess i'd need to follow up with them specifically yeah i mean i if if we don't know you don't you don't have to follow up i i just thought we might know the reason okay um we have two block grants uh, that we are should be voting consistency tonight uh, and let, I guess let's just take those early if we can right that those are C and D can we get those out of the way we had hearing no objection uh, we had previously considered the um, we did we did not vote these at the uh, at the work session but we we talked him to death and I think reached a conclusion that we're ready to vote. If, if I'm wrong, somebody tell me. That's All right. my understanding. Yeah. Uh, so Charles, this is uh, typically we would like to have our, our resolutions done ahead of time and ready to vote. And obviously we've had our processes a little disrupted by turnover and events, and that's just going to have to be okay. Um, so usually we have a, resol a resolution in front of us when we're ready to vote them. But uh, given the urgency of getting the CDBGs done uh, and the circumstances, uh, I think we ought to go ahead and vote it with a, if, if members are comfortable voting it with a resolution to be drafted after. Um, these are these are fairly straightforward. We're not doing conditional or anything. These are these are for uh, clean consistency. Uh, sure. Now, just let me ask just a general question because I'm new. Would you guys um, do you have a template resolution that you use, or and would you like me to do the drafting of the resolutions for your signature, Mr. Chair? Um, so different different village uh, land use boards have done this a little differently, and typically planning wants staff to draft their resolutions, but historically we've had um, council draft ours. Uh, sure, no problem. Because they are uh, sometimes 
fairly involved and you know for a variety of reasons historically we've had council do them okay. uh I, yeah i think we may change that sometime in the future but i think for now we should stick with our practice of having council draft the resolutions um the, and we can we can give you a we can give you uh some samples of our past resolutions um chairman burt yes before we get too far down the path here so i didn't mean to interrupt if you wanted to finish a thought there but before we go too far down the path i want to ask you a question about the plan here you go ahead um so my recollection and help me remember is that we had sent letters you know regarding this in, in these these items in um we have had a couple of discussions around how it would be very difficult to vote consistency on these items without, you know, a set of plans um, and the type of information that we usually request from applicants. Um, oh, thank, Seamus, thank you. Thank you for reminding where we, we, we were in a different place on this than I, than I thought we were. We sent our communication, which is that these are, the, we don't have a complete plan. We can't vote consistency on these. We can only tell you that based on the plan, We've touched this base. These yes. are done. I, yeah, I, I didn't know if there was something that, new. I that, that, that was my bad. I should have taken these off agenda. We dealt with these at the at the at the work session. We made our communication to uh, to to the board regarding these applications. We don't uh, we don't vote full consistency until they come back to us for the full plan. That that was my bad. We we were real clear on where we were at the work session, uh, and I with with the focus on the applicant items that were up tonight one of which was very involved. Um, I, I lost track of where we are. Thank you, Seamus, for reminding me. We don't need to vote these tonight. We, we, we made our preliminary determinations and we have touched that base and that's done. That leaves us only um, the moving forward, the process of proposed amendments to the um, LWRP. Yeah, and on, on that front, what I'd say, but welcome, you know, any discussion that's worth having. Uh, I've asked Amber to post, and she has the red line of the LWRP to this um, meeting's um, uh, agenda. So that's sort of on public record as of the point at which we're picking it up, the red line from back in March of 2020. Um, I'm so sorry, I just want to very quickly jump back to the the, the grants. Um, when, when you're saying that you, you've made you made those um, recommendations to the board of trustees. But did that letter, was that letter sent to the board of trustees? Oh, I, I thought it was. So if it wasn't, we're gonna have to circle back to this very quickly. Okay, and it, did, were you under the impression that I had sent that letter to the board of trustees? And, and right. did you send me that letter? In which case, um, Perhaps we can coordinate from there. All right. It's been a heck of a week. Now, now I got to check. Let's let's deal with this offline um, sure. tomorrow morning when everybody's had a night's sleep. I, I, well, we certainly reached a conclusion about what we were doing. I, I thought at one point I'd signed off on text of a letter. Um, maybe I'm misremembering it, but we can. But we've got the board's given its the the commission's given its input. We just need to to you know make sure that got formalized and if it didn't we'll do it okay i'm i'm sorry i should have had that clear in my head and i didn't i was focused on the applicants uh because it was a big night on on the applicant front um okay and now so lwrp seamus you're in the middle of the sentence so so back back to that if amber is that that, that work are you good okay um so I think we now have kind of posted to the record here, the red line that's gonna be the starting point as we've discussed at our work session, um, which, which was public as well. Um, we have a issues list and a small working group to move forward. So I don't think there's any discussion to be had. I think our team needs to do what we discussed at the work session. And what I think we would do is in advance of the next February meeting, again, on the agenda, we would have posted um, the progress that we've made on this document and perhaps our issues list um, as we populate that. Um, and so I would expect to add those documents. Um, my, my goal for the next, um, for February would be that we would have our issues list populated substantially and that we would just take this red line and, and, and clean it up, accept comments, accept things that are good to go and start moving from there. Um, and so unless 
anyone has anything to add, um, I think we just have to do the work in between these meetings and kind of update on status on, on the meetings themselves. Sounds right to me. Thank you very much, Seamus. Thank you for taking the laboring oar on this. I really appreciate it. Seamus, I just wanted to clarify real quick. Did we identify already who, who you wanted to do, clean up those red lines or is that something you want to discuss in this small working group? Uh, I, think, I think Steve, Steve me, you and Amber, Martin, um, probably should just discuss. Um, I think th there's a couple of discrete kind of work streams to get to the next work session, which we have a couple of weeks before. Um, and so let's do that because I know one of the things we want to do is just inventory the maps and try to decide what we're going to do. Um, and then we need to clean up the document. Um, so let's decide who, who it makes sense to take a stab at that. Um, okay. Yeah. That works. Thanks. Okay. So I think there's there's some follow up with staff first thing tomorrow on an applicant item and a couple of non applicant items. And other than that, we've uh, we have run our agenda for the evening. There's um, there's minutes outstanding. I haven't had the time with them, uh, so I want to punt that. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much, folks, for uh, for a useful and productive meeting, uh, for volunteering your time because none of us gets paid to do this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Take care. Good night. Good night.